This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 667, recorded on September 25th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York State, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well. How are you doing, Daniel? Uh, I'm doing all right, actually. You know, still, uh, this thing is still dragging on and it's sort of sucking uh, sucking the life out of a lot of us, I know. I, I just, you know, told Vincent some uh, hopefully entertaining stories, so he's going to be all cheerful. People are going to like, you know... I, I thought he was grumpy, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only grumpy um, <laughs> when it's necessary, right, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I've always found you very pleasant. So. Thank you. Um, but let, let's start off with a quotation. Um, and this is a quotation by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, Fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. So nice. I'm hoping that uh, we can all keep working together here. Um, so, so I plan to make a point today um, to really like, as I talk about each thing, I want to make sure I, I give all the different people credit because I'm, I'm not doing this by myself, right? I mean, this is, um, you know, this thanks to you, Vincent, thanks to the other um, people on TWIV, um, but really thanks to everyone who's been emailing, calling, Skyping, Zooming, meeting in person, a little less in person now than, um, you know, back early on. Um, but I, I really think that, um, the progress that, that we're able to make, um, is because a lot of people are working together. Um, and, you know, quote Charles Darwin, maybe some people have heard about him, maybe some of our listeners, maybe we have an audience <laughs> that's heard of Charles Darwin. Um, but in the long history of man, of humankind and animal kind too, those who learn to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. So there certainly are some people who just opted out, you know, during this pandemic, didn't want to communicate for whatever reason. Um, but most people, you know, just to be positive, they've really risen to this challenge, been incredibly generous with their time and energy, um, you know, and, and as mentioned, these weekly updates are not just my own. They're really, you know, the conversations, the contributions of all these people, these tremendous people um, that I, I try to bring um, to, to TWIB each week. Daniel, are um, the numbers still rising in the New York area or are they flat? So we're sitting right about, we, we do a lot of tests in the New York area, right? Mm. We do about 80,000 tests a day. And we're wow. sitting here right about this 1% positivity rate. Daniel, um, the 80,000 tests, are they symptomatic people? No, it's, it's a mix. It's a mix. Mo, uh, we've really um, embraced in the New York area the screening approach. So a lot of people are getting screened. Okay. Um, so, yeah. And, you know, I, I'll mention a little bit about, you know, some of the, we're still seeing, you know, the patients come in the hospital. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But yeah, I mean, this is a nice segue because I always like to keep a human face on the numbers. You know, people hear 80,000 tests. They hear, you know, another 800 new diagnoses per day in New York on average. Um you know, and again, it's not just about the numbers. I think right. we quoted Taylor Swift at one point, right? Um, these are individuals. This is someone's mother, someone's sister, someone's brother, um, someone's daughter, someone's friend. Um, so um, for starters, let's bring people up to speed with some good news. My work colleague who's been in the intensive care unit now for over two months, um, we are expecting her to be able to go home tomorrow. Now, wait a minute. You said last time that she couldn't get <laughs> yes. off oxygen. Yeah, she's going to go home on oxygen. Okay. I mean, you know, in a sense, when you ask me how I'm doing, we, we've, we've changed the bar of what makes us happy. So um, I was talking to, to her today. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm always flattered when she speaks Spanish with me because usually she speaks English, which, you know, I guess is a reflection <laughs> on the level of my Spanish. <laughs> because <laughs> I think it might be exhausting to her to have to speak Spanish with me. And so, but today she <laughs> yeah. a little Spanish, which I think meant she was doing better. Um, I don't think it reflects on my improvement. If anything, my ability to speak Spanish is deteriorated. Um, but no, she was saying she was a little bit worried about mm. going home, needing to be on the oxygen. Um, yeah, this mm. is, uh, this, this will be tough. I mean, she still has a long road um, for recovery, but it's a huge milestone and yeah, looking sure. forward to her 
hopefully get it out. So this will be released Good. on Sunday, but here we are recording Thursday. So I'm hoping Friday, right before the weekend, she goes home. Great. Um, my other patient, the one who attended the wake, who lost her husband, mm-hmm. um, you know, by the time this drops, she will be home as well. Um, so that's um, some nice things. But unfortunately, as some people recover, others um, fill their spots. Mm-hmm. Uh, my partner in New Jersey just admitted a man who um, he attended a wedding um, and he's not the only one who ended up sick after that mm. wedding. So um, these are the things we of, know transmit infection. People should know this. Yeah. So who's having weddings with guests? Just <laughs> exclamation mark, question mark. Um, you know, yeah. Um, maybe Skype weddings. I mean, the, the two people getting married, yeah, you, you know, you, you're getting married. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure you need to bring um, guests together because it's a tragedy. You know, the yeah. individuals in the hospital, other people in the hospital. Um, a couple more people I admitted. One was um, a, a woman who actually just admitted her this morning. Actually, she came in over through the night um, and her daughter was sick down in Virginia. She was there with her daughter um, and then they figured out the diagnosis the daughter had was COVID. So now the mom is in our intensive care unit on high flow oxygen. Um, so not so great. Um, and another, another just admitted this, this a non-union Sparky. And one of our listeners know what a Sparky is. Now, my goal in life was not to become a clinician. I was forced into this by my parents, <laughs> my controlling parents. I wanted to be like a plumber or an electrician. Um, you know, so the electrician slang is a Sparky. Right. Um, but then I felt like you had to concentrate and pay attention too much to be a Sparky. So I was thinking maybe a plumber. <laughs> what um, is there a name is, for a plumber? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not using that on the air. Okay. We might have some younger people listening. Okay. <laughs> it's uh, not complimentary. Got it. Um, people can email in and we can read that in privacy. But <laughs> uh, but this 92-year-old gentleman is a World War II veteran. Um, so we were talking this morning about, um, first he was in the European theater. Then he was actually in the Japanese theater. Wow. Um, so the Pacific theater. Um, spent some time in the Philippines preparing for the invasion of Japan that never came, fortunately. Um, but he actually started to get sick on, um, on Friday. Um, Sunday, he was getting sick enough that he was admitted. I initially saw him Monday at that point, um, wasn't requiring any oxygen. Um, and I, I think it's always good to walk through uh, because it, it helps us, you know, sort of you know, how much have we, have we learned? Um, but then on Wednesday, day five of illness, he actually started to require oxygen, um, which is a little bit early, right? You, normally we say it's during the second week. And what we've learned is the earlier in the course of illness that a person starts to require oxygen, um, the worse their prognosis. So he starts to require oxygen, um, you know, initially like, you know, early on. So we, we start him on remdesivir, right? That does something. Um, also start him on um, steroids. So we have that mortality benefit. Um, and particularly at him, right? You say 92 year old, he's a male, he's got hypertension, he's getting sick early on in disease. His neutrophil lymphocyte ratio was rising today. Um, so there's probably a benefit there. Um, he's on anticoagulation. Um, and we'll see how he does. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the new data about tocilizumab and, and whether or not this gentleman will be a candidate for that. But, um, you know, we're, we're, we're still seeing the cases. Um, we're still doing the best to try to keep these people, um, you know, with us, um, getting them out the other end. Um, news. Remember, I'm, I'm really good at good news. To, this is going to be the episode that people refer to as maybe when Daniel's wife calls him a bucket of sunshine. There's no uh, there's no sarcasm that maybe it is sincere. Um, so I actually have some some good news. Um, Saturday, September 19th, we set a record in the United States. One million tests, one million COVID-19 diagnostic, not serology, but diagnostic tests in a single day. Um, so. I want to just say that um, it looks like testing as as an approach is really being embraced. Um, this week, I, I was on a call with Chris um, Syed and Phoebe Ohava. I don't know if you know Chris Syed, but he's the one who set up rapidtest.org, uh, the whole the Michael Minow website. Um, and uh, we were all on a call with the Heritage Foundation. 
Um, and they basically, you know, were, were wanting to talk about the, the possibility of using rapid testing, we'll call them lick of sticks. Um, but yeah, the idea of using, you know, rapid frequent testing to, um, open schools and businesses in a safe way. So, I mean, there's, there's reason to be optimistic. This is, uh, you know, a lot of really bright people um, who, who are thinking like, hey, this is something um, that really might be an approach that makes a difference. Um, uh, what I thought was nice um, in this conversation was that there's a lot of modeling out there where people say, I have this model and, and this suggests it worked. Um, but it was nice that I was actually able to bring up some real life experiences, things that we've been doing in our different organizations say, you know, this is actual, we've been doing it and it works. Um, so I'm working on a number of papers right now. Um, one of them is with um, Scott Shimatsu, Ariel Johnson and Ethan Burke. And this was actually, um, we're writing this up um, for emerging infectious diseases where we looked at twice weekly testing in a long-term care facility um, in Pennsylvania. And this was an area, Chester County, where the other facilities were seeing an average of 15.8 infections per facility. And with our twice weekly testing, we saw only two infections in that facility in this period of time. Pretty dramatic, you know, and, you know, and that's, you know, this is a very vulnerable population. Um, you know, in the words of Peter Hotez, um, you know, COVID is the angel of death for people in nursing homes. This, this is saving lives. This isn't just reducing infections. This isn't just about numbers. It's actually about saving lives. So testing, you know, forget about, you know, just models. There's real life experience that it works. Um, I also want to, uh, we talked a little bit on this call with the Heritage Foundation about the, um, the success we've had with the National Hockey League. And I was like, I, I know the Islanders are, are not in the finals, um, but there are Stanley Cup finals. Um, you know, and I credit um, Dr. Elliot Pellman, who got me involved and actually listened to my advice um, when I had my zero tolerance testing ideas um, and got the NHL to listen as well. And I think that, I mean, that's a success, right? We actually had an NHL season. We had an NHL Stanley Cup. And this was all built on a on testing on testing individuals, keeping infection from uh, spreading through the league. So this, this again. How frequent um, was the NHL testing? It was very interesting because we did the, the bubble paradigm. So before a person could enter um, the bubble, what we did is you had to be tested. You had to be quarantined for 14 days. Um, then you had to be tested again. Um, and then anytime there was any concern at all, there was repeat, we were doing saliva testing. Um, there was repeat rapid resulting testing. Mm. Um, so the idea would be you get a test. If you're negative, you still could have been infected. You're early on. So you yes. just wait to make sure it's, it's not incubating 14 days maximum. Yeah. If you're still mm -hmm. negative, then you're negative, right? Exactly. And I think that's, I'm going to talk a little bit mm -hmm. about that quarantine because that, that's important to have that in the model. A negative test today doesn't predict the future. Yeah, right? it's, sure. it's like a pregnancy test. You know, you can't have a pregnancy test the morning after and think that now you're fine. It, yeah. it takes time for things to, to develop. Uh, yeah. And we also talked on this call about all the success we've had um, working with Bonnie Simmons, Adam Fitterstein, Z Baker, um, using testing to open up the entertainment industry. So when you guys mm -hmm. are watching... Um, and gals, everyone um, is watching all the productions, you know, by Lionsgate and Netflix and Amazon Prime. And we, we have, um, you know, these different um, industries are up and running and filming and creating contact and uh, content. Um, so, yeah, there's been there's been a lot of success here. Um, we're we're working on this much promised online testing calculator um, where people are going to be able to go online, put in your prevalence. Um, you know, the, whatever sensitivity of the test or specificity, the frequency you're looking at. Um, and I'm working on this with Natalie Shields and Ethan Burke again, Caleb Kennedy, uh, Greg Ling. And this, hopefully we're going to submit to the New England Journal next week. And then people will be able to look at their situation and say, you know, what makes sense for us as far as frequency? Um, what makes sense for us as far as which test we might be using? Um, and, and really gives you a chance to run the scenarios and decide what's best for you. So 
um, it's exciting. I think this really enforces um, that testing works, testing can allow us to open stuff up. And the big thing I said to the Heritage Foundation, you, know, you talk to a, a big business and you say, oh, it's $100 to test. That doesn't work for a school. We need, we need affordable, inexpensive sure. tests. And I think everyone's getting behind this. So I shouldn't say everyone. Lots and lots of people are getting behind this. So I, have, I think there's tremendous reason to be optimistic here. Um, but let's talk about this little issue about the specifics of um, quarantine and isolation. I just got an email to address this today. So, so what do you do? And the CDC now has has clarified, right? They they listened to TWIV, right? And they they said, okay, yeah, we'll we'll fix that that little sort of error on our website that was confusing to people. And, and they now clarified it very simply. They say anyone who has been within six feet of an infected person for at least 15 minutes should get a test. Um, you know, and this works well if you can create a visual in your head because um, there's going to be a little subtleties here because the question is, when do you do that test and how many tests do you do? So let, then we're going to talk about the incubation that, that Vincent brought up. Um, it takes from two to 14 days from exposure to when a person gets sick, if they're going to actually end up, you know, being being an infected, symptomatic person, some people go through that period. They never show any symptoms, but they still might be infected, and that's what I talked about with the hockey league. You don't want someone at day fourteen. I feel great. They may be asymptomatic. You let them into your pod, into your school, into your hockey bubble, and and the world falls apart. Um, so so what? How do you how do you sort of address this? So quarantine is 14 days. We're gonna talk about isolation, which is different. So quarantine, um, you know, when, when might you do that first test? You really don't wanna do it any sooner than day three. Um, sooner than day three, very, you know, limited number of people will have become um, positive by then. Um, day three is a reasonable first day. Um, day seven is another, that's gonna actually pick up most people by then. Um, day 10 is reasonable, but you really want another at day 14 to know that this person, you know, ducked, what is it called? Duck the thing, missed the gun, whatever the expression, but got through this without getting infected. Um, why are we doing a few tests in here? Because then there's the other issue of isolation. What happens when that test turns positive? So let's say you get tested on day seven and the test is positive. Now what you need to do is you need to isolate. And that's a little bit different. So isolation is you isolate for 10 days from the time you test positive for a virus or the time you have onset of symptoms. And then at the end of 10 days, you have to be without fever. Your symptoms have to be getting better. And this has to be without taking medication. So this is a, you're taking Tylenol and that's why the fever has gone. Um, so I think that this is, uh, hopefully this clarifies um, sort of testing approaches for folks, but testing is good. We all like it. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so some treatment and drug updates. Um, so yeah, by the time our episode dropped on Sunday, I think everyone knew about the monoclonal antibodies. So that was, that was good. I was a little worried. I was, uh, you know, jumping the gun on that and sharing confidential information, which um, um, I try not to. Actually, I'm not good at keeping secrets. So yeah, that was, um, I was, we were talking about that at the hospital today and they're like, Dan, there's a show, Curb Your Enthusiasm, you should be on it. Um, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, the monoclonal antibody stuff is, is exciting that that's out there. And actually one of the nice things, you know, we, we keep talking about, oh, but you got to go to an urgent care and someone's got to be intravenous. Um, but some of the monoclonal antibody um, therapies, and I don't know, people listening um, have osteoporosis or know someone with osteoporosis. Um, but uh, previously I um, did consulting, I'm going to say, for Amgen was involved in the development of denosumab or prolia, which is a uh, monoclonal antibody, but it's just subcutaneous. Like you can just inject yourself and there are millions of people that do this. So this could be, you go somewhere, you get your diagnosis and then, you know, the pharmacy delivers it to your house or you pick it up and just an injection under the skin. So um, this is another way, you know, and yeah, these therapies are not cheap. They cost hundreds of dollars, but if you can really keep people out of the hospital, that saves tens of thousands of dollars and lives. That would have to be tested though, of course, right? To make sure for, for SARS-CoV-2, it does work. 
Yeah, so I'm not saying don't use denosumab, <laughs> but um, these <laughs> monoclonal yeah, yeah, these monoclonal antibodies that are now being tested by yeah. Regeneron and Eli Lilly and Amgen. Um, yeah, we're actually looking, and and not all of them are IV. Um, some of the preparations okay. can just be injected under the skin. So these are all in phase two and phase three trials. So How long would exciting. they last, Daniel? Two weeks or so? You know, it's interesting. Um, you, you only need them to last a short period of time. And when you develop these antibodies, basically, you know, if you think of them as a Y, that stock part, think of it as a slingshot, the part you hold in your hand, by modifying that stock part, you can modify their half-life. Right. Um, so it's perfect to have a half-life of about two weeks. Um, I guess if you thought about it, um, you know, going into the season before you have vaccines, you could, you know, give yourself like a one that lasted six months, like the denosumab one. Um, sort of be protected for the season. Um, but hopefully I'm, you know, thinking by that period of time, the vaccines will uh, be giving us a little more um, efficacy data. Um, so stay tuned um, for these. Um, you know, we still have remdesivir, as I mentioned. I've been getting a lot of questions about vitamin D. Yeah. Um, stay tuned. We'll <laughs> talk about that next time. Okay. <laughs> so. Yeah, we, we've also got a bunch for you. They want, a, they want a, a discussion of it. Okay, so we'll have a discussion. I promise this will be, you know, tune in next week because, yeah, I've actually been doing a little bit of work in the vitamin D um, area as well. So um, I'll, we'll share some of that next okay. week. Do you take vitamin D, Daniel? I do, actually. Yeah, I do. Um, 50, I do. 50,000 well. units once a week. 50,000 a week. That's a lot. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Isn't the, the, the daily is, well, if you took a thousand a day, that would be 250% of the daily minimum requirement. Yeah. So you're you know, okay. I don't get I don't get out a lot. I don't get a lot of sun. I don't know if you've noticed. That. <laughs> well, I don't either. Most of us are not. And I was on a I was on a call with a doctor last week uh, who treats uh, CFS patients, and she said we should all be taking vitamin D because most of us are indoors now. Yeah, it's um. You know, I was I was t I, we, I said I was going to talk about vitamin D, but apparently we're going to talk a little bit. Um, I always tell my patients, listen, you don't really need to take supplements. You know, you can get all the vitamin D you need from the sun. You just need fifteen minutes of full body exposure to the sun at the equator, and you need the skin of an eighteen year old. And and I just don't see why no you can't problem, do it. no problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's all right. Let's talk about next week. I'm sorry to. <laughs> no, that's okay. I enjoy talking about vitamin D. So we're going to get back to vitamin D, you got a teaser there. Okay. Um, the cytokine storm phase. So we had some interesting developments. Um, it was a bit in the press because finally we're actually getting to see some, some data. Um, so the Actemra trial on tocilizumab, um, finally out there. Um, so we can actually see what the, what the data is. Mm -hmm the data is and judge for ourselves. Um, so there are a couple interesting things. Um, I, I've talked in the past about our experience seemed to be that people that had a background of steroids who then got tocilizumab did better than people who got just tocilab, tocilizumab. This is an IL-6 receptor inhibitor um, all by itself. And in the Actemra trial, they weren't quite as strict. And so some people got steroids as well as tocilizumab. People who didn't get tocilizumab were much more uh, likely mm. to end up getting steroids. Um, but in this trial, they had an eight-day shorter hospital stay, so eight days shorter time to hospital discharge, and that was p-value less than you know 0 0.05. Um, if they ended up in the ICU, it was almost six days shorter stay. Um, but a big thing that that was picked up in this study and another was the impact on reducing your chance of ending up on a ventilator. Mm. And in this study, there was a 24% reduction um, in people ending up on a ventilator. Um, so that that was that was kind of nice. There was no increase in infections. There was no increase in mortality. I know a lot of people had fears about that early on. Um, and then there's a second um, trial where we got a little bit of information, the IMPACTA trial. Um, and this is where they actually did a, a really good job of um, enrolling a more diverse population than a lot mm -hmm. of our studies have had. Um, and in this uh, population, uh, patients who got tocilizumab, or we'll just call it TOSI, were 44% less likely to end up either on a ventilator or dying. 
Um, so hazard ratio of 0.56, and again, p-value less than 0.05. So um, no increase in infections, no increase in mortality, no sort of negative impacts. Um, but boy, if you can reduce my chance of ending up on a ventilator by almost 50%, that's um, encouraging. So these yeah. patients received the drug in hospital once they were admitted, right? Yeah, and that that seems to be the timing that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I just submitted a paper with Paul Merrick, um, who is um, sort of people famous for vitamin C, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know he was he was bemoaning the fact that people have not really thought about the the phases of the disease, like mm -hmm. the viral phase early on, the cytokine phase um, following that, and it really makes sense to target therapies um, to time your therapies based on what you're trying to do. If an antiviral, you give it early. A monoclonal that's going to neutralize the virus, you give it early. If you're trying to target the cytokine storm, mm -hmm. these are your sick hospitalized patients. It's second, third week. Daniel, I was on a call with an ID, chief of ID at a, at a hospital in Bergen County. You probably know him, but he showed a slide with the four phases, just like you do. He must have got it from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, he got it from all of us. I want to <laughs> take credit. We've all been sharing our experiences. So yeah, um, the clotting phase. Um, so this is the, the all the clots that we worry about. So the American Thoracic Society, American Society of Hematology, um, you know, broadly recommending that all patients be put on um, thromboprophylaxis. Um, the ASH, so American Society of Hematology, goes a little further and, and actually suggests that in those hospitalized patients, it's low molecular weight heparin, a particular um, um, one to choose. Um, you know, and, and uh, I guess we're still bemoaning as we meet that there aren't as many randomized controlled trials. The, the data helping us in this area is still really low quality. So um, it's difficult, you know, there's, it looks like there's a trend towards um, improved mortality with anticoagulation. Um, but, you know, this is not without risks. This is with major bleeding risks. Some people, you know, gastrointestinal bleeds. Um, there is a present risk bleeding into the cranium, which can be devastating. So, um, again, a call to arms to get some randomized control trials and, um, and give us the information we need to make the right decisions by our patients. Um, tail phase, um, you know, I, I think it's now becoming more and more clear that many people are six for months and we're really learning how to treat the symptoms. So, you know, if you're listening to our, our podcast and you're having symptoms and you're being um, poorly treated by the medical profession, find a, find a physician who, you know, takes this seriously because um, you can make a difference um, for these people, whether it's how you treat the headache or how you treat the cough or how you treat the insomnia or the rash or the mental health aspects. There's, there's a lot we can do. So. Um, don't give up, find a doctor who uh, can take care of you. Um, and vaccines. This is pretty exciting stuff, right? This is my Bucket of Sunshine podcast uh, intro. Um, you know, the, the public is getting a bit concerned about safety issues relative to the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, so, you know, I'm going to promise, um, as I think a number of us um, have, that we're going to just keep, um, you know, unbiased, solid scientific information about what we know to help our listeners navigate these waters. But um, this week, a fourth COVID-19 vaccine candidate went into phase three or efficacy trials in the U.S. Um, Johnson & Johnson announced the start of its phase three trial. Um, first doses were, were given um, this week. And uh, so um, this drug maker follows Pfizer and Moderna, um, whose phase three trials began in late July. Um, AstraZeneca started its phase three vaccine trial, um, but it's still, at least as we're recording this, um, um, when I last checked, still in a bit of a pause, at least in the US, while they clarify the safety issues. Um, but w what is exciting about, about this um, Johnson & Johnson um, adenoviral COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and it has a couple nice features. So Pfizer and Moderna vaccines require two doses about a month apart. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine um, can be given as a single dose. Um, there is a small subpart of the study where they're gonna look at second doses to see if that makes a difference. But in general, this is a one-shot vaccine. 
Um, in addition, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine only requires basic refrigeration. Um, you know, Pfizer's vaccine has to be stored at, I don't know, like minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit on the dark side of the boot or something. So there's <laughs> issues there. Uh, Moderna has to be um, in a freezer as well. So uh, I know Dr. Anthony Fauci called the latest vaccine trial launch a very important advance. Uh, you know, and he's a reserved guy, so that's huge. <laughs> so, um, but I, I should say, uh, you know, full disclosure, right? My, I've been talking uh, for a while about my role at United Health Group, and we've been working with Johnson and Johnson to create these readiness cohorts for this trial. Um, so, you know, we've been doing this for a while, and actually, it was back in March I started working with this woman, Deneen Bolta, and she's the executive vice president um, and chief medical officer of global research and development for United Health Group. And she's actually, I think, the main reason I got involved with UHG. Um, but they created a lot of these um, programs to help um, people who are trying to. Um, move things forward with COVID-19, I'll say. And so these readiness cohorts were created. So people go to this website, it's a very nice website, maybe not as nice as Microbe TV or Parasites Without Borders, but um, United in Research. And you can actually, and people have been pre-enrolling um, for this vaccine trial. And so what, this is uh, really clever, this thing is now that it's in phase three trials and we need 60,000 people enrolled in this trial, this email blast goes out to all those people that have said they want to they they want to be considered. Um, we look at areas that are considered hot spots, and then what people can do is, um, you know, if you're in a hot spot, if you meet the criteria, we start with a narrower range of people. Um, are you bringing up United in research there? Uh, see the, it at the. Uh, I'm looking at uh, a site where you can go to see if you can get into a trial. Okay. Yeah. So if you actually, if you go to United in research, okay. um, right at the top, you can actually pre-enroll. It should really just be like um, enroll at this point. Um, but you can actually become a citizen scientist. And so, you know, it's, yeah, these see, vaccines yeah. are, yeah, these vaccines are not going to just um, give us efficacy data mysteriously. They're going to take tens of thousands of, let's say, brave committed individuals who are willing to get that vaccine um, see what happens, right? I mean, we, we don't know yet, um, you know, and so um, over the coming months, as we see, unfortunately, an expected rise in cases, we'll see people who got the vaccine or the placebo, is there a protection? How much is that protection? Um, and so I, I think, and actually the same, you know, if you register to be a citizen scientist, we've got our serology test there where we're going to follow 5,000 people um, who have positive COVID tests right. and see like, do those antibodies stay up? If those antibodies stay up or go down, who might end up getting reinfected? Is there any, any ability for us to predict? So, um, you know, I thank people like, um, Deneen Volta and Steve Catani, the chief scientific officer at, uh, UHG, um, because we really need partners like this. Um, we need a lot of people working together to get the vaccine trials, to get the research, to get the numbers, um, to get everyone together on this. So um, I'm going to finish off on that note, you know, go to unitedinresearch.com, become a citizen scientist, help us um, get past COVID-19 and get back to, uh, you know, shaking hands and hugging and having big weddings. Um, and um, I also want to thank everyone. This will be our last episode where we're going to be asking for support for floating doctors. Um, and I think we're going to make our goal of being able to, um, to give them $40,000, which is really critical. Um, so people go to parasiteswithoutborders.com, um, donate. Um, this is a tremendous organization. Um, these people down in Panama um, are really having a tough time with limited access to medical care, but also just basic food and everything else. So. Um, Thank you to all our listeners who keep being so generous. All right. I, I started to fill out the form uh, at United in Research, but oh, I have this to, is great. I did it and I got to the point where they don't like my password. So I have to work on that after we record <laughs> because now I have, I have a few questions for you. Oh, do you want to tell me what your password? I could help you. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't long enough. They, did, they want me to put more things. So I have to wait. Um, okay. All right. I have a few questions for you. Uh, this is from Stephen Ripple, D-O-M-D. And TWIV665, an important topic, was almost brought up but not fully discussed. 
That is, if one is in a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine trial six months to a year into the trial, someone's vaccine is released, should that person be allowed to know if they are in the placebo part by simply asking? This is a serious bioethics issue that I know many would appreciate hearing the opinion from each of TWIV regulars as well as Daniel Griffin to each person answering individually. I, as that individual, would like to know so I can make the necessary choices as to remaining an unprotected person or receiving protection. Yeah. Um, you know, this is, these are different times. I think we talked about this last time. Um, you know, it's, un, um, what was it? unprecedented was the word that we, yeah. that we've been using way too often in the last, uh, six months. Um, but this is a unique situation where um, we're going to start to have efficacy data here in the next um, few months, actually, for a number of these vaccines. Mm -hmm. And an interesting thing, then, is it's going to make it harder for, you know, if your vaccine isn't the Johnson & Johnson, if it isn't the Moderna, Pfizer, or AstraZeneca, and data comes out that there's efficacy here, um, you know, and you're in the placebo group, you're going to start to to wonder like, hey, can I get access to something that works? Cause I got placebo and placebo is just not going to protect you from COVID. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and the other issue is what about um, the other vaccines? Because are we going to put mm -hmm. all our eggs in one basket? Because we don't know how effective. So if a vaccine is 52% effective at preventing you from getting ill, I mean, going to the doctor or hospital, um, that's really not good enough. We need more. Um, so um, <clears throat> this is, I don't know how each different company is going to select to do this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's pretty easy to figure out if you were in the placebo trial, I hate to say, you know, you just go get a serology test and you know, you're <laughs> going to know. So uh, there really isn't a way to, to tell people that they, you know, can't sort this out. Um, I, I hope people are not doing that because then that might affect their behavior. People might feel like, oh, I've got the vaccine. So now mm -hmm. I'm going to go out and go to that bar because I feel protected. And then it'll look like the vaccine doesn't work because there's different exposures. So this, this is a great question. Um, this is uncharted waters. Um, it's going to be it's going to be difficult, right? Because this will this will only affect efficacy data. We're going to have that pretty soon, I think. Um, it's not going to affect safety data because the people who are in the arm that got the vaccine, those are the ones where we're going to be looking at risk. It's going to be a little bit difficult because right? we usually compare. We say these people got the vaccine, these mm. people didn't. What was the difference in serious adverse effects between the two groups? But you're still going to be able to see. Do we see transverse myelitis? Do we see MS? Do we see, you know, whatever other um, uh, above what we would expect people to normally get? So this will muddy those waters. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, my opinion is that if you want to do a proper double blinded trial, you can't tell people what they got uh, because yeah. and it's not an ethics issue because that is that's what you sign up for when you sign up for a vaccine trial. You're saying I accept this. And yeah. if you don't, don't sign up for the trial. That's that's what I think. Yeah, I mean, I think to get back to the concept, you know, second, when people go to, you know, United in research, they become a citizen scientist where, you know, we're all in this together. It's a community thing. Yeah, and um, sure. a lot of us are making different sacrifices. And yeah, the people that are going to make this sacrifice and allow us to have the science to know which vaccines are effective, which are safe. You know, in the next six months, you're going to have some efficacy data, but that's all you'd have is some. Yeah. You're not going to know the long-term protection. And the, the very interesting feature um, that we should bring up, this concept that I've I know mentioned before about antibody-dependent enhancement. Mm -hmm. And this is actually, you know, sort of encourage people to sign up for our serology study because what we want to figure out is, you know, maybe you have a certain level of antibodies and it's protective. But when you get to a low level of antibodies, they can actually potentially, we've seen this in dengue, for instance, they have the potential to make you sicker yeah. than if you never got a vaccine to begin with. So, yeah, we really need people to stay committed to these trials um, so mm -hmm. that we can figure that out. The last thing we want to find is, oh, that vaccine that looked like it gave you really good three month protection is the one that you don't, if you don't get it every six months, you're going to get really sick. Right. Um, and I think as we mentioned before, this whole butterfly effect, you can't just be mixing and matching. Um, you know, we need this data. It's really important. All right. The next question we got from several people. This is from Evan. Daniel Griffin talked today about the possibility that masks might be more effective than a minimally effective vaccine based on the estimated 50 to 75% effectiveness of masks 
versus the nominal 50% threshold for vaccine approval. I think Daniel may have underplayed this difference. An important distinction is that masks like physical distancing are effective at preventing infection, while the primary endpoint for vaccine approval has been repeatedly described as prevention of disease. This means that masks could be significantly more effective at actually reducing virus prevalence in the population. Yeah, you know, I think um, I think Anthony Fauci recently came out saying um, that he thought that even once we have vaccine, masks don't go away. It's for a while, these may be yeah. complementary approaches. I agree. And so, yeah, no, I appreciate it. That's this. a good point, though. It is a good point. Yeah. All right, we have a quote sent in from Churchill. Our peoples would rather know the truth, somber though it may be. Addressed to Congress, December 26, 1941. Do you like that, Daniel? I like that. I think okay. that's great. Uh, and hopefully that's what we're giving. We're giving um, the truth. I mean, I think people need a place where they can go and know that they're going to they're gonna get the truth. They're going to get what the science says, not what we would like the science to say. All right. One more from Liz. Question for Dr. Griffin. This may seem kind of a stupid question, but should people with genetic thrombophilias consider themselves in a high risk group with respect to COVID-19 complications, with all the talk of blood clots, that seems like a given, but I haven't found much discussion of this or any studies about it. Do you know of any? Yeah, this this is, I sort of mentioned this briefly, it is really um, somewhat painful how limited data, how limited the data is at this point about what to do about the clotting complications. Um, and so we, we don't have much guidance here. This is just sort of thinking things through and trying to figure it out. But yeah, I would, I would think if you have a, a disturbance in your uh, coagulation system, um, that, that theoretically puts you at increased risk, but we don't know. This is, you know, um, this is where we're trying to extrapolate from from what we know, but we're extrapolating out into a data free zone. So these I don't understand. What do these people uh, do? These people with genetic thrombophilias have clotting issues. So it can go it can go two different. Yeah. So thrombophilia. So, you know, sort of the love of clotting. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, these are people who are more likely to clot just even at baseline. Got it. Um, it's reminds me, my dad always says when I can't under, he's like, oh, just think about what it means in Hebrew. I'm like, yeah, it's great to speak Hebrew. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so, so here I was like, just think about what it means in Latin, you know. <laughs> so, Got it. Um, yeah. So it's uh, but I think philia people are. Okay. With that. But yeah, so if these people are going into with a baseline increased risk, then yeah, you would, you would worry that something that is triggering activation of that system is going to put them at higher risk than someone without a disturbance mm -hmm. in the system. So if you had a patient come in with COVID-19 and a thrombophilia, you would make sure they had uh, treatment for that, right? Yeah, you know, across the board, as I mentioned, it's uh, generally recommended that people are put on um, some sort of prophylaxis. And just the issue with the anticoagulation is, is, is it at just this low prophylaxis dose? Do you put it at a full dose? Yeah. And, you know, at this point, we we have evidence that there's a, a mortality reduction to um, these different approaches. Uh, but you really have to individualize it because there's a risk. This is not without risk. So a person mm -hmm. like this, you know, you're going to figure this into your calculation of Got whether it. or not they should be at low dose or higher dose. All right. That's our weekly COVID-19 clinical report from Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. All right. Thank you so much. And everyone, thank you for listening and supporting all the stuff that we do. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. Cloudy The weather out today, outside huh? is a little overcast. Uh, the temperature is supposed to hit 80 sometime today. Seriously. Which is quite unusual for this time of the year. And uh, we haven't had rain in about two weeks. It's uh, been warming up here. Yeah, it's 24 today because it got chilly rain. for a while. From Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. It is a stunningly gorgeous day here in Austin, <laughs> Texas. It's uh, 81 degrees right now, headed for 86. Uh, bright sunshine. It's going down to like mid 60s overnight. Oh, good. It was just, more. it was barely 60 this morning when my wife and I went out walking in the dark, uh, which is just a, a relief for us. It's, it's uh, glorious. It's great. And from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it's lovely here. It's 73 um, Fahrenheit 23C, nice, clear, sunny skies. Um, it's supposed to get up to 82, but it's already mid-afternoon and it's yeah, still in the 70s. So I don't know. 
If you like what we do here on TWIF, consider supporting us. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. If you'd like to chat with a virologist, go to asv.org. Along the bottom of the page, you'll see a link to that. And uh, by the way, ASV, it uh, holds a meeting every year, the American Society for Virology. Next year, it's going to be virtual. Is that the right word? What does virtual mean? P-A-R-T-U-A-L. I don't know if it's the right word, but it's the word we're using. It's the common word. Almost or nearly yeah. as described, but not completely or according to strict definition. I would say it's going to be online. How's that? <laughs> it's like, <okay. laughs> yes. It will be the meeting. Everybody uses virtual for to say, but uh, either that word has acquired a new meeting, which is possible. It has. Yes, or, so um, it's it's Zoom is a virtual meeting platform. So I we're see. having a virtual. It, it is nonetheless a meeting that we're having, but we say we're doing it virtually. So that will be uh, J July nineteenth through the twenty third of twenty twenty one, and uh, it will further announcements will be coming. And the, the meeting was originally going to be in Montreal or Montreal. It's too bad it won't be there because it's a very nice city, lovely city. But uh, we will also do a TWIV from ASV. And this time, everybody can be there because we don't have to go anywhere. No travel. And so involved. are they going to do um, uh, go to Montreal in 2022, they hope? I think there's a schedule of places, you know, so they okay. can't skip around. Because this year was supposed to be Fort Collins. And, you know, that don't... Okay. So. And finally... If you'd like to learn some more virology, many of you are not aware of my online virology course, the recorded lectures of my Columbia University course, virology.blog slash course. All right, today we have two papers for you, which both have to do with a virus called SARS-CoV-2. <gasps> I've heard really? of that one. It's a coronavirus. Yeah, it's a coronavirus. I think so. And yeah. you, you know, we haven't talked much about it, but no, <laughs> um, it's pretty obscure. First one is a Lancet uh, article, which I thought uh, everyone would like to hear us discuss. This describes the Russian vaccine that was so famously in the news a few weeks ago. The phase one and two trial results were published. Safety and immunogenicity of an RAD26 and RAD5 vector-based heterologous prime booth COVID-19 vaccine in two formulations, two open non-randomized phase one, two studies from Russia. Non-randomized, they took people as they came. Boom, boom, inject, inject, inject. They didn't put them into groups, just took them as they come, which is one way to do a trial, but mostly we do randomized trials. Anyway, the first two co-authors are Denis Logunov and Ina Dojikova. And the last author is Alexander Gintzberg. Gintzberg. They are from the Ministry of Health of the Russian Federation and First Moscow State Medical University of the Ministry of Health of the Russian Federation. A little overlap there, I guess. Not familiar with Russian academic institutions or ministries. All right, so this is a combined phase one, two. Uh, uh, they call it an open trial. Does that mean it's not blinded? I think so, yes. Yeah, open label is what we would call it, yeah. So maybe right. it's the same. So they know who's in the control group and who's in the study group as the study is going on. Yeah. Yes. They do have a control group, okay, but it's not randomized and it's not double blind. So what they doing here is uh, which is uh, excuse, excuse me which yeah, is yeah. not untypical. Yeah, that's that right, is for a phase one two perfectly legitimate in a phase one two trial. This is at this point you're trying to get safety information. That's the main purpose of a phase one, and um, some kind of if it was a drug, it would be pharmacokinetic. In the case of a vaccine, you're looking for immunogenicity. You're not very importantly, you are not looking for efficacy. Right. You're not going to wait for these people to contract or not right. contract COVID-19. You're just exactly. seeing, does it, does it hurt anybody? And do they develop some kind of an immune response against it right. that looks good? I mean, the one thing I will say about this, I have other things to say, but you know, the total number of people enrolled is rather small for a combined phase one, two. Yeah. So typically phase one, you would have about 30 to 40 healthy adults, and then phase two, a few hundred, and we only have 76 for both here. 
So it's a bit slim. And the reason I mention that is uh, I have studied extensively Sabin's vaccine and the trials it went through. And I have a wonderful paper here called Role of My Cooperation with Soviet Scientists in the Elimination of Polio, Possible Lessons for Relations Between the USA and the USSR. <sighs> 1987, <laughs> you know, you can have all the lessons you want. People are not going to listen anyway. The point of this is Sabin developed his oral polio vaccine in the 50s. And by then, the Salk vaccine had already been licensed in the U.S. And the U.S. said, we don't want your vaccine. We don't want your stinking vaccine. They didn't say that, but it would make a good movie, I guess, right? Right. Albert, we don't want your stinking vaccines. <laughs> anyway, so... Sabin had been born in, in the Soviet Union and he still had friends there, including the head of virology, Chumakov. And they, they worked out a, doing a clinical trial in the Soviet Union. And they did like 20,000 children right wow. off the bat in the, in the 50s. And then they wow. immunized 15 million children. So the point is, you, the Soviet Union, which part of which became Russia, used to do a lot of people in the trials. I don't know why only 76 in this one. I'm speculating. And and I would say Albert Sabin is rolling in his grave. Do you know that expression? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, in this uh, paper, that's a two-component vaccine, and they decided to use vectors, adenovirus vectors that had some experience with that. And they said, we want to be able to boost uh, prime and boost. And to do that, we're going to use two different adenoviruses. So we don't have any immune response against the vector interfering with the with the boost. And this is an ongoing problem with uh, or concern with adenovirus vectored vaccines because adenoviruses, too bad we don't have Kathy here, um, are widely circulate. And in humans, I mean, odds are you've had one or both of these at some point. Um, so if you've had adenovirus 26 and you use a recombinant adenovirus 26 as a vaccine, your body already has an immune response against the virus that's carrying the vaccine antigen and it may not get right. anywhere. Right. And so here they're trying to get around at least, they, they will have given somebody an ad 26 vaccine as a prime, let's say, and then they're going to have fresh antibodies against ad 26. So they use a different adenovirus for the boost. So, uh, and as uh, we've started to discuss here, the two adenovirus serotypes used are ad5 and ad26. My understanding is that ad5 is pretty common. Right. There's a lot of seropositivity to ad5 in the population. Ad26 is less so, much less so. Right. There's yeah. not as yeah. much ad26 as around. Uh, and my understanding also is that um, the... Uh, that people who are seropositive to ad 26, that does there historically there doesn't seem in experiments like this doesn't seem to be much interference with the effectiveness of a vectored vaccine in people who are seropositive. But we can keep our eyes on that as we look at this paper. So they both both adenovirus vectors. They're both human adenoviruses. They carry the gene for the SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein. Right common with many other vaccine Everybody's approaches. Everybody's of choice, yeah. And they have two preparations. One is five, one is 26. Uh, 10 to the 11th viral particles per dose for both. And all the participants received full doses. It's quite a bit of virus. Mm -hmm. 10 to the 11th. That's 10 with 11 zeros behind it, right? Right. right. Am I correct? Uh, and also for the newbies uh, uh, out there, uh, these vectors are engineered such that they are non-replicating. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the spike protein is, uh, there's deletions in essential control regions for virus replication that uh, basically knock the replication out very early. Uh, and the spike protein is stuck into one of these uh, deleted regions. Uh, so it really is truly is a vector in that, uh, oh, and it, you use a, cell line that provides the missing function called generically a complementing cell line in order to grow this otherwise defective uh, recombinant vaccine. Uh, and it becomes truly a vector because you wind up with a virus particle with this 
viral genome with uh, the spike gene spliced into it, and it delivers the viral DNA to cells uh, following the injection. And you get uh, expression of just a couple of viral proteins uh, and the spike protein and virtually no, uh, actually beyond virtually, genuinely no virus replication. Okay. Yeah, it's it's a one round event for the virus. Mm-hmm. It can it can get into a cell. It can start making its proteins and express them, and that gets you the antigen. And then the virus can't proceed any further. It can't replicate. It can't initiate an infection. And in the viral vectored vaccine world out there, there are several other viral uh viruses that are used as platforms uh right. and they can be either non-replicating like this or some of them actually undergo some replication though they're sufficiently attenuated or otherwise non-pathogenic in humans so that the vector itself doesn't cause a problem right now this dose of 10 to the 11 they say was based on Findings of preclinical studies, which is unpublished, so we don't get to see why they decided, but presumably in an animal model of some kind, they decided 10 to the This 11. was a good dose, yeah. So the, I'd have to look it up, but I think that is, uh, you know, it's in the same sort of range as I've seen with other clinical trials with other adenovirus vectors. I'm going to try yeah, and look up okay. the AstraZeneca study. So we have two preps, frozen, it's called GAM-COVID-VAC, and lyophilized gam covid Vac Lyo. Okay. Gam COVID Vac. Gam COVID Vac Lyo. Uh, and the study was done at, uh, of Gam COVID Vac was done, well, that's the name for both, at a branch of a hospital, which is an agency of the Ministry of Defense. And they say both civilian and military volunteers took place uh, in that. And the study of gam covid vac Lyo, the other one took place at a university and all volunteers were civilians. Uh, vaccines are given intramuscularly in the deltoid muscle uh, during phase one of both. <laughs> That's right. Uh, they received one Same dose. Same place you get your flu shot. One dose intramuscularly of either vaccine were assessed for safety over 28 days. Phase two began no earlier than five days after the phase one. <laughs> That's good. Usually you begin a year after, but <laughs> it's accelerated. Uh, and then during phase two, participants got the prime boost. All right. So the phase one is just one shot. Phase two is the prime boost. You get one dose of one on day zero and the other one on day 21. And uh, no randomization or special selection. Participants were included as soon as informed consent was signed. You sign the form, you get your shot. Shot. There you go. And then part of the study was to compare, of course, they're looking for safety, as as, uh, Alan said, side effects and so forth. They want to look at immunogenicity, and they compared the immunity induced by vaccination with natural immunity after SARS-CoV-2. They have convalescent plasma from 4,817 people from Moscow who had recovered after COVID-19. So this And this, too, is... Pretty typical standard, right? of yeah. how these these trials are being done. All of the companies that we talked about on the vaccines episode, they're they're comparing their results with convalescent serum in the in the early trial. The uh, AstraZeneca, I just looked it up. The AstraZeneca trial with the chimpanzee adenovirus vectored spike protein uses five times ten of the tenth particles. Okay. So that's yeah. very similar. Now, one one thing I must say is that. Um, the, the, these individuals are not diverse. Uh, they are mostly white no. men of young age, between 20 and 35 years of age. Uh, so uh, that could have been improved on, right? The phase one, of course, you want healthy people. Yeah, that's fine. in a phase one, you line up a couple dozen healthy yeah. young people who are probably not going to be too badly hurt, even yeah. if something goes wrong and and that's who you use. But right. yeah, you'd like phase to see you. a little more diversity in the yeah. phase two. And I think they, they do admit that in the discussion. All right. So mm-hmm. primary outcomes, safety and immunogenicity. That's it, as Alan said. And remember, zero to day 28 uh, is the phase one and then zero to 42 in, in the phase two. So the phase two happens no earlier than five days after the phase one. Then that goes for 42 days. And then they measured uh, antibodies, binding and neutralizing antibodies, and also uh, T-cell induction of T-cells and interferons, right? So what do we have? Uh, 
This happened between June and uh, 18th and August 3rd, 76 adults for both studies. Um, most common reactions, pain at the injection site, hyperthermia, headache, asthenia, and muscle and joint pain. No adverse events requiring termination of the study, which is good. So yeah. this looks standard. This is reasonably good. All right. And then what about the phase two? And by the way, this the data are all here. Um, phase two, uh, looking at, they looked at binding antibodies and neutralizing antibodies. The binding antibodies go up. Uh, the neutralizing in both in both groups, in uh, neutralizing antibodies only um, giving both the prime and the boost led to antibody neutralizing antibodies in 100% of participants. If you only give one, not all of them got neutralizing antibodies. So. Yeah, fundamental message in this study, as in I think all the other vaccine studies that we've uh, looked at, is that the boost is important. Two shots. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. for some reason I had in my head that the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine was... Uh, one shot, but the uh, phase three trial that I just looked at is a prime boost. It's a prime boost. Yeah. The, the only uh, company I've heard talking about a possible single shot is Merck is hoping that they might yeah. have like a very effective first shot, but they're still planning everything as a prime boost. Uh, so was, uh, yep. Go, Go ahead, Richard. Jackson. No, I was just going to say something about the, uh, the older uh, vaccine development that I'm familiar with was the swine flu. Um, uh, that was developed by Merck after the uh, case of uh, swine flu at Fort Dix. And I was wondering how many people you'd have to trial on these uh, the opening trials. And Alan might have the data. Is how, how many people do you have to go to before you come up with one guillain Barre? Oh, the, it tens and tens and tens of thousands. It never would have shown up in a in the right. trials. No, no, that was, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So one but, in yet, and if it shows up, then what happens? In a then, trial? Boom. Yeah, then you pause the trial and yeah. figure out what the heck happened and try and figure out if that was right. related but, to uh, the vaccine or not. Someone wrote in exactly. a few weeks ago, the, the rate of Guillain was one in 100,000 doses. Yeah. So they would never pick it up, even in a 30,000. That's right. Okay. And in Efficacy. fact, even if you did a 100,000 patient trial or or you did a 50,000 patient trial and somebody came up with Guillain-Barre, there's no way you would statistically connect that to the vaccine. You, you'd need to you'd need to have millions of vaccines delivered for something like that. Which so there was one vaccine trial. AstraZeneca had one dry, trial sh sh shortened yeah. as the result of uh, fewer than how many people? 20,000 or 10,000 people. Yeah. Um, um, oh, you talking about logic. the transverse myelitis? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It was. It was paused. It was paused. It was paused. paused. You know, paused. Only, only, paused. only for a week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so they, somebody somebody had a an issue, a neurological issue, um, and they determined that that they appear to have determined that it was not likely vaccine caused. And right. so the trial has been picked up again. Has it been picked up uh, in the U.S. or, or just in I the think U.K.? It, it was still paused in the U.S. last I saw, but it's restarted elsewhere. I think yeah. it restarted in the U.K. Uh, the, other, uh, uh, the other point I wanted to make about this particular study that I find attractive is, the, uh, is that they're testing a lyophilized preparation. I don't know if we yes. commented on that specifically yeah. yet. Yeah. <laughs> that means it's freeze-dried, which really... Uh, helps out with distribution of the vaccine. Yes. If you can oh, distribute sure. something freeze dried and reconstituted on site, then, then you don't need cold chain, and that'd be great. And from everything I can see here, it looks like the lyophilized preparation works as well as the refrigerator. As good as the, the other, yeah. As, mm -hmm. as, as Daniel Griffin mentioned in his update, a new, another phase three trial has begun in the US, and I believe they are hoping to have a single dose with that one. I don't remember the company. Does anyone know offhand? It just began I this do. week. Don't. So I, I just don't think single dose is going to work. I think it's... Uh, uh, it doesn't look that way to me. No. But of course, well, it's no, the, the based way you on would, everything else we've seen. Yeah, the way you would develop that is you'd probably plan a two-dose trial, and then you'd look at the antibodies after dose one, and you'd proceed with your two-dose trial and say, well, you know, 98% of the people had the same antibodies after dose one, um, and then you might subsequently yeah. try yeah. to go for a single dose. At least that's the way I would yeah. do it. Just so according it. to this trial... Uh, administration of only one adenovirus gave a seroconversion rate of 61%. Uh, and so it's 100% when you give the prime boost. So that's why they're saying this is going to be a, a prime boost. So uh, seroconversion 100% on day 42 for both vaccine formulations. So that's good. 
And the levels are similar to convalescent plasma. We have this figure two here, humoral immune response. And you can see with time, the different uh, immunization schedules, either binding antibodies or neutralizing antibodies. And you can see the big range of convalescent plasma. And these all four fall within that range, right? So comparable whether or not they last, who knows, but we'll find out. Exactly. They also looked at cellular immune responses. Um, they said, um, uh, and they measured these T cell responses by measuring gamma interferon secretion. Found this in 100% of volunteers. Um, so they're making T cell responses, although again, how functional they are, we don't know. But that's also been the case with the other vaccine trials that we've discussed. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm really interested in the uh, reactions to the vectors here because they do this yes. thing where they mm -hmm. go ahead. They uh, measure uh, the uh, antibody response to the individual vectors. So, right. mm -hmm. if you immunize people with the ad five uh, vector and then uh, measure the uh, amount of reaction to either ad twenty six or ad five. Uh, at zero and 28 days, you can get an idea as to how much background there was to either vector and whether or not you get a vector specific reaction. And basically it's everything that you would expect. Okay. Mm -hmm. When you shoot somebody with ad five, they made it make an ad five response Ad 26. They make an ad 26 response and both of them, you get responses to both of them. And as I look at the data here as the time zero, the background levels of uh, zero positivity to add five and add 26. I don't see a big difference. Uh, yeah. in contrast, in contrast to what I said earlier. Right. But it's small number of patients. It's small it's number. Hard to really say. Yeah. A small number of positive and a small number. And it's, of yes. And it's, and it's a, a big distribution of them across those. So what they do say is that zero positivity, uh, uh, baseline zero positivity to start with to one vector doesn't seem to compromise the uh, immune response to the spike protein. Right. Okay. So the fact the immune immunity to the vector is not compromising a vaccination, which seems to be almost generally true with a lot of these. Yeah. From what I can tell. So that's the study. They conclude this, these vaccines are safe, well tolerated. They induce strong humoral and cellular immune responses in all the participants. Um, you know, when this was announced a while ago, it got widely criticized. But I think if the paper had come out, maybe it would have been less criticized. And the final sentence of the um, abstract, or the uh, they've got a little... Um, summary at the top of the research in context is further investigation is needed of the effectiveness of this vaccine for prevention of COVID-19. Of course. <laughs> yes. Which is true. Yes. There's Which no, is true. There's, there's no uh, phase yeah. three here. Yes. But that's. Yeah. Uh, They're saying this is a phase one, two, and we've determined that it's seems to be safe and immunogenic. And now there we are. This vaccine has been provisionally approved under the current decree of the government of the Russian Federation. Yeah, now that's the problem. <laughs> well, it's um, not a problem for us. No, so no, it's not. <laughs> it so might be a problem for them. So it's provisionally <laughs> approved, but then mm -hmm. they say provisional licensure requires a large-scale study, and that's a phase three. So there's this, I don't know what a provisional approval, is that an yeah. EUA or something like that? There's been a, okay, so there's been discussion of this, and I'm still not clear on it because I am not a lawyer even in the US, and I certainly wouldn't pretend to understand how the regulations work in, in Russia. Um, but a, somebody somebody said that the, the way the provisional approval is written, this could be distributed more widely. Mm -hmm. And there's been commentary, this credible commentary to that effect, that this could be kind of a stealth approval um, type of approach. So it's not exactly an EUA. It's... Yeah. It's something else, I think. Um, <laughs> if okay. we have any Russian health policy experts who can write in, at reasonable odds we do, um, <clears throat> go ahead and, and let us know what the heck is up with this. Because we've gotten, I, I've gotten at least conflicting news from otherwise credible sources saying, well, you know, it wasn't really approved or, well, you know, it was kind of approved. Um, it, it is definitely true that Putin bragged about the fact that they've got a vaccine yeah, that's, right 
you know, even though this phase two trial was actually when other companies in other countries were setting up phase threes, they were just setting up this. So this is behind the curve. Um, and on the strength of this trial, they gave it this provisional approval, which is something that none of the, you know, AstraZeneca or, or Pfizer or Moderna, they don't have anything like that and they aren't pursuing it. Yeah, you wouldn't without um, phase three results ever elsewhere, yeah, right? Yeah, because this is, this is something you just don't do. You, you need to do the phase three trial in order to determine whether it actually prevents disease and also to get um, a, to, to look more sensitively for any safety signal. So they're not broadly using this until the phase three. Is that what we understand? I, I think, but again, you <laughs> know, see, see above for disclaimer. I, I, yeah, yeah. Some of You'll the news, know it after they do it. Yeah, it, does, news, it, it doesn't sound from the paper as if there's going to be broad distribution of this, but it does except, sound as if, as if in some uh, in some situations, they're going to go ahead and use it. Mm -hmm. the, the issue there, I think, is that the people who are authors on this paper don't actually have any say in any of that. I suspect. Right. So I think what's been said by people in charge in Russia implies that this is going to be deployed before there are phase three results. And that is a matter okay. of considerable concern. So they plan for the people, of, for the people involved. Yes. For the people okay. involved. Yes. Yeah. I and mean, if they want to do that, it's their business. I wouldn't. No. And, and I would just point out, I mean, if somebody's watching this video a year from now and it turns out this vaccine was highly effective and, and worked out, everything worked out just fine and they deployed it widely without phase three and it was all great. Um, that still does not make that a good decision. Right. It just means you got really lucky. <laughs> right. The one thing I would say is that uh, I would hope, and I, this will probably happen. I would hope that ultimately there is a good phase three trial, even if it's being deployed uh, among people and, you know, in a, not in a controlled fashion, I would hope that there would be a controlled and appropriately randomized double blind placebo controlled trial on a large scale that would tell you generally what the efficacy is. I'm, I'm, I want to believe that that is in right. process right. <laughs> and I, I don't have any information on it. They plan a phase three with 40,000 volunteers. Okay. I think it's, it, it was approved. The, the phase three was approved on August 26th. So it might've started already. It could be starting any day now. So that sure. will happen. And so, so it's, it's possible that everything is operating just fine and the politicians are just being politicians and blowing yeah. smoke. And maybe nobody's going to get this vaccine until the phase three is done, but Putin needs to drum up support because, you know, he's rigging elections and all that kind of thing. And, and so he's going to say, oh, we've got a vaccine, even though nobody's going to get it until the phase three is done. Another good lesson in trying to segregate the politics and the science. Yeah. Um, so people may say, well, these are adenovirus vectors. Other companies are using them. Why would you expect them to be different? But uh, there are different in every lab where you make them, you know, the production yeah. can be different. The, the way it's put in, the gene is put in could be slightly different. All of that could make a difference. That's why you have to test every one. That's and, why the FDA requires a separate set of trials for each one of these. That's right. Okay. So there you go. Um, yep. A little now thin. There's, <laughs> there's also been some, some discussion around this publication. Some people are... Oh, yeah, saying that right. the that the data look fishy. Yeah, so I found an I article in Nature, and um, it's titled "Researchers Highlight Questionable Data in Russian Coronavirus Vaccine Trial Results." They say some of the figures were duplicated. Frankly, I couldn't find it, so I don't know. And, and the author said these are the data. We didn't do anything. So and, and uh, retraction I feel watches. Like I'm, I'm not qualified to. I mean, I, I don't do clinical trials. And so I'm looking at this and saying, well, it's a phase one, two, and I don't know what, maybe something's duplicated. Maybe there's something in the figures that if you're a statistician, you'd look at and say, oh my God, that can't be right. Um, and uh, okay. Um, but I think one of the major gripes in this was that uh, the way this was published, they didn't, uh, people accessing the article could not access the raw data, mm -hmm. which is 
uh, that, which, okay. is, which is becoming more and more common. Yes. Uh, in particular stuff like uh, clinical trials. So there are raw data behind the graphs that uh, you see. And if you're really going to try and pick it apart, uh, you'd like to see that. And the way this was published the, wasn't available. I don't know why. Greater transparency on the data would be good. Yeah. Okay. I could see that. So I don't know what's up with this, uh, you know, duplication of data. I couldn't find it, but maybe someone can. Yeah, and often when the, when there are data duplications, um, I mean, coming from a molecular back background, I've seen this with gels, you know, in papers where somebody mm, duplicates yeah, yeah, a lane yeah. in order to try and prove what they what they want to say, and and then you read the article about the the research fraud and and the investigation and they show the figure and I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> and then they, then if somebody highlights it. Oh yeah, that is duplicated. So it's kind of like a spot the differences game with, mm. with these sorts of things. And if that happened, then, you know, shame on them. But if it didn't happen, then this is a, this is a legit phase one, two trial. I'm sure we'll find out. I'm sure that Indeed. will eventually come out. All right, now we have a second paper, which I think is extremely important. This is a journal yes. pre-proof from Cell. It's called A Mouse Adapted SARS-CoV-2 Induces Acute Lung Injury and Mortality in Standard Laboratory Mice. And Ralph Barrick mentioned these results when he was last on and said he couldn't tell us the mutations because he would have to kill us, but now they're published. <laughs> so he <laughs> won't have to hurt us in any way. <laughs> uh, so this comes from Ralph Barrick's lab, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And we have uh, Leist Dinnen as uh, co-first authors and Ralph Barrick as the senior author. So the, the thing here is that there have been a bunch of mouse models made. Transgenic mice ex producing uh, human ACE2. Um, uh, using different promoters, transduction of the ACE2 gene with adenoviruses or adeno-associated virus. But as he, as they sum summarized, uh, each of these uh, are, are accompanied when infected by SARS-CoV-2 with a mild alveolitis and then, in some cases, fatal encephalitis. And so he says they don't recapitulate the severe lung disease that that's hallmark of COVID-19 in yeah. humans, of course. Yeah, and, and the, issue, the issue is if you just take SARS-CoV-2 and give it to a mouse, regular mouse without transgenic or, or any other modification, it doesn't, it doesn't that's right. take. That's right. So, so you can either have no infection or you can have an infection in a transgenic mouse that doesn't replicate the, the human pathogenesis. Right. So, so far, no animal model gives you acute respiratory distress and acute lung injury seen in human infections. Right. And many people are trying to do that. You may recall, we discussed uh, a paper from Routh's lab previously where they introduced two amino acid changes in the spike. And now that virus will infect uh, wild type mice binding to mouse ACE2, but again, uh, a mild disease, not the serious ARDS. And you're, working, yeah, you're working with the the modified virus. So what um, they did here. I, I just want to jump in real quickly if Ralph is listening. In the introduction where you say the elderly and those with underlining comorbidities, that should be underlined. <laughs> okay, continue. <laughs> Underli I have trouble underlining. I, I suffer from this condition. It's called copy editor's eye where it just sometimes stuff jumps out at me. Yeah, this is a uh, pre-proof. I, I presume it will be yes. corrected. Proofed. Yes. Yeah, proofed, actually proofed, right. <laughs> okay, now, so they want, as Ralph said, what they did is to take that virus, SARS-CoV-2 MA, where they have changed two amino acids in the spike. Now this will infect mice and BALB-C mice. Um, remember, that's what they start with. Then they passaged it 10 times. So the virus has the ability to infect mice doesn't cause this lethal disease, but they said, let us passage it. Maybe we can select for or isolate a more pathogenic uh, virus, experimental evolution in vivo. More pathogenic in mice. In mice. That's a critical, yes. critical point that I want people to remember as they listen to this. Yes. Now, the people who are against gain of function, this is a gain of function for mice. You need to do this 
And this is a BSL-3 experiment to begin with. It's SARS-CoV-2. Need to do this to understand and to test. So please do not object to it. Well, you and this type of it. experiment goes back to the dawn of virology. I mean, this anytime somebody's passaging something repeatedly through an animal host or through animal and cell culture, um, that is just that's one of the oldest types of experiments you do in virology. Yeah. So you intranasally infect the mice, and then every two days you remove the virus that's reproduced and you infect new mice. All right. And so uh, with passage, they observe the linear decrease in body weight over time, eventually greater than 10% body weight loss uh, by passage 10, two days after infection. So 10 passages in mice now, you're getting 10% body loss by day two after infection. So it's increased and they plaque purified uh, a virus and, and showed that this plaque purified, it's a clonal isolate, right? Plaque purified is also able to cause this uh, body weight loss by day two. And then, of course, and these are young adult BALB-C mice. Uh, they deep sequence the RNA uh, and uh, they purify the virus and they find what changes have occurred in the genome. So in addition to the two amino acid changes in the spike, there are five additional changes, all resulting in non-synonymous coding changes. That is, they cause the change in the amino acid sequence. And these are in, and we'll talk a little bit more about what these proteins do later, NSP4, NSP7, NSP8, another change in spike, and ORF6. So five additional amino acid changes. Whether you need all of those or some, they're working on it. <laughs> yeah. But right now they're working with passage 10 plaque purified. And I have to say, it looks great. And this is just beautiful. Now, uh, so this is called SARS-CoV-2 MA10. So MA was their original engineered virus and then 10 passages. Uh, it, can, it can reproduce in and form plaques in vero cells, vervet green monkey kidney cells. And they say, that's good. So we can grow up stocks of this virus and we can measure its titer by plaque assay. But it was attenuated compared to wild-type SARS-CoV-2 in primary human bronchiolar epithelial cells. So they say this suggests it has de decreased fitness for human cells. And this passage type of thing that we're talking about, where you pass it through an animal multiple times with a human virus, <clears throat> is in fact a way to try to develop an attenuated virus for purposes of a vaccine. Yeah. So it's not at all surprising that it's attenuated in the human cells. Yeah, so I would uh, I would generalize for our new er listeners out there. Something that kind of took me a while to catch on to is that, uh, by and large, uh, this is not always true, but uh, I think generally viruses are tuned to a given species. Yes. Right? And they don't easily jump from one species to another. And so in this particular case, where you retune the virus from the human species to a mouse species, you find that it's lost some of its uh, specificity or fitness in the human species. Yeah. Per, all, all makes sense. And uh, as you say, Vincent, we'll get to the individual functions, but the why of that is one of the biggest mysteries out there. So the next set of experiments are very relevant to, to an arc we have had. How much virus do you need? Yeah. <laughs> and this is mice. Remember, it's, going to be different in people and we're dripping you know <laughs> virus right into the nose which is not how we get infected lots of caveats yet got some answers here they did a dose ranging study in uh, balpsy mice and you can see a dose dependent increase in morbidity and mortality morbidity is disease mortality is death of course over 14 days and 10 to the 4 pfu 10,000 plaque forming units 20 percent mortality 10 to the 5th 60% mortality. 10 to the 2 PFU, 100 PFU, produced increased weight loss compared uh, to 10 to the 5 PFU with the parental MA strain. So you can see it's got increased virulence, right? So you need 10 to the 2 only of this passage virus to get comparable weight loss if you in inoculated uh, mice with 10 to the 5 PFU of the MA virus. And so, uh, and so for uh, 
for reference, I pointed this out, I think, last week. Uh, one paper that I've seen that tries to estimate what an infectious dose of coronaviruses is in humans did uh, uh, a study, I think, that was relevant to uh, the original SARS, but it came out without with about 250 infectious units um, being an infectious dose in humans. So uh, I would call between 10 to the two and 10 to the three, closer to 10 to the two, uh, something that is uh, kind of sort of physiological, if you like. Yeah. And what you see here is, I mean, it's, yeah, it's a dose response, but there's really a threshold effect where you go 10 to the two, eh, mice got, uh, some of your mice get a little, they lose some weight. You go 10 to the three, everybody gets sick. You go 10 to the four, everybody gets sick. You go 10 to the five, everybody gets sick. So it's, it, there's a, there's a definite step where, okay, we've really established an infection now. Yeah. Is there weight loss in a human um, infection? I don't recall that being one of the listed symptoms or signs. I don't think uh, so. it's, it's not something that typically uh, people measure. That's an interesting question, Dixon. Yeah. I wonder. Uh, it's just in, <clears throat> in these animal models, it's an easy thing to measure. Yeah. You just plunk them on a scale. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes that's the only sign of infection you see. Right? Yeah, if, if you, you don't want to take them to the opera. if you don't want to sack them, you know, you can right. look at weight loss. That's a, you know, Dixon. I think if you had a, if you're intubated in the ICU and oh, yeah, you're probably sure. going to lose probably weight, weight right? Weight you're probably losing some weight. But that's yeah. for anything where you're intubated and just getting IV fluids, right? And, and generally, when you're sick. You know, if you're if you're hacking up a lung, you probably don't want a big breakfast. And it, <laughs> I think weight loss is a pretty common thing for people who are ill. Yeah, but it's it's an easily measurable thing for animals that are. No, Ill. no, I, I totally agree. I tell you what, if our numbers come up, let's uh, keep a chart. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep a chart, right? <laughs> All right. So they decided to use ten to the four PFU, so they wouldn't have excessive mortality, right? If you want to look in the mice and see what the virus is doing in the lungs and so forth, you don't want them dying on you, right? So that's why they use 10 to the four to do some of the, and then they say, let's look at the pathogenesis. Let's see what's going on. So they infect mice and they look at what's going on for seven days uh, using um, a, a variety of approaches. Weight loss is fourth, first. Uh, they rapidly lose weight, reach maximum weight loss at day four. They lose 16% of starting weight. Um, and then five days later, the weight loss trajectories diverge. Many recover and others die, right? 15% mortality rate. And so then they And they take, lose a lot of weight after they die. <laughs> that's true. They don't gain anymore, that's for sure. And then they look inside and they see... You could see acute lung stage damage, right? Firm, red, heavy lobes, and they scored these on the extent of congestion. Um, and um, they can see this damage peaks at four days and remains high through seven days. Virus reproduction peaks at one to two days after infection. And then if you've survived by seven days afterwards, it's pretty much gone. So that's a really rapid peak of uh, virus production and kind of similar to uh, what's happening in humans, although not just one to taste post-infection, but a very short period of uh, virus reproduction. Mouse uh, physiology runs faster than humans. It does tend to, yes. Uh, replication in the upper tract. So that's the lung, the one to two day peak. In the upper tract, nasal cavity virus titer remains high one to three days post-infection, but then five days, boom, not detectable. So very rapid course here. Uh, then they measured pulmonary function to see they use plethysmography, whole body plethysmography, WBP. Uh, infected mice had a loss in pulmonary function as indicated by changes in, in this WBP uh, and so forth. Histopathology, that is you make sections of the tissues, you look at them under a microscope, but what's going on there? Uh, two, four, and seven days. Uh, damage to airway epithelial cells, uh, including the bronchioles. And this corresponds to where virus proteins can be detected by immunohistochemistry. Very intense two days. Wayne's at four days is gone seven days post-infection. So once again, correlating with the virus production, very rapid course of production accompanied by cell damage, 
and then resolution. Epithelial denudation. What does that mean? Well, the epithelium is being stripped off. It's being killed. Um, and lots of inflammatory cells are coming in. Cellular debris, fibrin deposition, plasma proteins in the lumens. And then afterwards, the cells start to regenerate. That's called hyperplastic with regeneration. The epithelia starts to furiously regenerate, and you can see that. Uh, they, can also, they also looked in the alveolar ducts and sacs. You can see that they were altered by infection, damage, and so forth. Um, the most severe lingering damage over time was in the alveolar region. So this is not just an upper tract infection. The virus is getting down into the lungs, clear. not of every animal, but at a good fraction of them. They also one of the things that uh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. One of the things that caught my attention was this bit. Now I didn't get into the supplemental data, so I just took their word for it. They say low levels of infectious uh, virus were present in the serum. Minimal mm. virus found in the heart, right? Which may reflect residual virus from the serum. Viral protein not detected in heart, liver, small intestine, kidney, or spleen. So we've had uh, some discussion here about the degree to which SARS-CoV-2 in humans can go systemic on you, okay, and infect other organs and et cetera. And I think uh, it's not clear what's going on there. I've And I've heard sort of conflicting conclusions because I think it's not clear. Yeah. In this mouse model, it's a model. All right. It seems to be primarily confined to the lung. It seems to be primarily a respiratory infection. And uh, one of the <clears throat> one of the critical uses of an animal model like this, especially mice, where you can grow up a bunch of them and do experiments, you know, on on multiple animals, is the ability to look in detail at pathogenesis in animals that didn't die. So one of the reasons that we don't have a lot of data on this in humans is because you're only going to get data on virus in the heart from people whose hearts you can sample. And that's not something you do when somebody got over it, yeah. I hope. Yeah. Um, so, that's right. so, and there's a lot of evidence that, you know, maybe the people who are dying of this, the virus is all gone by the time they're dying. So then if you have a model like this that accurately, and I, and I think... From my reading of this paper, I would say these mice are pretty much developing COVID-19. I mean, sure, it looks yeah, like the, it. The respiratory it's, it's, part. The respiratory yeah, part. Yeah. The, res the respiratory part. So yeah. that's, yeah. You, and, and it was inoculated correctly, right? Yes. So it went in through the respiratory route and yes. it develops this respiratory infection. And it looks like the kind of ARDS pathogenesis. Yeah. And so now you can go and ask these questions like Rich is saying. You can say, well, where else is it? And. They're looking at that here, and there's no. It's actually pretty remarkable how 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 well it mimics the human disease. Yeah, and there's no encephalitis, right? Right. So that tells me that in humans, where there are neurological symptoms, that's secondary to immune responses. In my opinion, I don't think the virus is getting into the brain of humans, and I see no evidence for that in humans. I think I think most of the bad outcomes, the really bad outcomes in COVID-19 are going to turn out to be immune mediated. The virus yep, sets some, the virus yep. sets something Agreed. off and then the immune system actually does the damage. Uh, they look at they quantify lung damage by two metrics and show that the damage increases with t time from 2 to 7 days post infection it correlates with the presence uh, a virus. Um, and then they say, what about age? So we know in humans, the older you are, the more likely you are to have serious disease. And so they say, let's infect aged mice and see if we get an increase. And so an aged mouse is one year one old. One year. They only live about two years. Well, mm -hmm. actually, they, most mice live far shorter in the lab. Yeah. But um, they can live. <laughs> well, they, they live far shorter in the wild, too. They, you know, they live until something eats them. But yeah. <laughs> How long do wild mice typically live? Do you have any idea? I, I, know I think until it's often a matter of months. But months and they get eaten? Because they're, they're mature and able to reproduce at a, at a, you know, a week. So three, like, three weeks. You know, yeah. a, matter of, a matter of... I can, of, I can give you the data for cats, which is well, a good... Uh, a good gives you an idea of what's going on because uh -huh. uh, a cat, a house cat that doesn't go outside lives 
about 13, 15 years. Average lifespan of a cat living outside is three years. Right. Yeah. It's a tough world out there. Yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, when we get to my pick, I will uh, elaborate on that. Dixon, what's the average uh, age span of a trout? Uh, some can live up to three years and several percentages of the population can make it to five hmm. and the rare fish lives to seven years and that's it. Are there How about salmon? What's their life cycle? They spend a lot of salmon, time out. It depends, it depends on the ocean that you're talking about. If you're talking about the Pacific Ocean, most salmon species live three years. They come back, they spawn, they die. Chinook is an exception. They have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cohorts. And in, uh, in the Atlantic, it's two and three years they can come back and then they die. Now, there are predators in the ocean of salmon, I would guess, right? Sure. What are uh, the, the, the salmon? All of the salmonids are predators except one. No, pre no the right, predators they're, of they're the kokanee. The kokanee salmon is a filter feeder, believe it or not. Uh, but there are predators who eat salmon. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> is absolutely <laughs> specialized. Who <laughs> eats the trout like bears? I, I just had some the other sure. night, as a matter of fact. <laughs> what, orca? <laughs> no, you no, no, swimming? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I had salmon. But, Dixon, no, in no, your uh, fishing area in Pennsylvania, there are no predators of the trout, right? Or are there uh, weasels? Are you, and, are you kidding? What kind of animals? Uh, we have eagles. Uh -huh. We have uh, mink. We have um, mergansers. We have uh, osprey. Okay. Bobcat. Um, Dixon de Pommier is a predator of trout. No, no, no. I, I throw them all back. <laughs> okay. I, I, I scare the hell out of them, but I throw them back. <laughs> okay. All right. So aged Mice, one-year-old mice, highly susceptible, high morbidity, nearly 100% mortality when infected with 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5. That's more than uh, the younger mice. Yep. Uh, if you infect see, these them. These are inbred mice, though, too, right? Yes, Balb C. Yeah, and that well, becomes important. And we're going to get to that in a moment, too. Huge. Yeah. <laughs> 10 to the 3 PFU, uh, these animals rapidly lose weight. Very few animals surviving. 10 to the 2 PFU, all of them survive. So they say that's the threshold to cause disease 10 to the two or higher. And that's probably because it's establishing the infection and proceeding. And you can do mm -hmm. these experiments in, in animals. That's why people are asking us, you know, is there a, a threshold for humans and what is it? But we don't, we can't do these challenge experiments as we can with mice. So here you can say over 10 to the two is what you really need to establish an infection. I'd love to see what happens though when you throw one infected mouse into a cage of uninfected mice. Mm. A good How question. They didn't do that. Yeah. Well, that I'm could, sure they're going to. I yeah. bet you they do. That would be, an that would be a to good do. Uh, experiment to do, or and yeah. put them in neighboring cages. I'm not sure exactly. Exactly. They can. So far, the the models do have not a group of mice so, that are wearing masks. So yeah, we so can test if masks. They, if they yeah. conclude that you did great transmission, would that be mouse to mouse recess? No, no. Yes, yes. <laughs> Come on, Alan, you should. This, no, the paper itself is mouse to mouse inoculation. I've already suggested that as a touch. Oh, so okay. with uh, ten to the three right. PFU, um, all the aged mice um, uh, lose weight. Thirty percent of their starting weight, um, and um, increased mortality with only fifteen percent survival. Um, now, with 10 to the 3, I'm sorry, um, the um, kinetics of weight loss are similar to young mice. However, unlike young mice, all the aged mice continue to lose weight and ultimately lose 30% of their starting weight, and they get 15%. Uh, they also uh, die or have to be euthanized. You know, if a mouse loses so much weight in the, in the lab, you have to s sacrifice them. Uh, you, can't, you can't let them live uh, longer than a certain endpoint. So um, these uh, older mice are clearly developing more serious disease. And then they looked inside of them. Let's look at the lung tissue. You can see uh, discoloration of lung tissue, maximum peaks on days four and five, replication peaks days one to two. The titers are similar to young mice. Uh, however, in contrast, levels of virus persist at later time points in the older mice compared to the young mice. And that's what we see in serious COVID, a persistence of higher titers of virus longer than in uh, mild infections. Um, low, as as uh, Rich said, low levels of virus in the serum at two days, but low levels and not detected in heart, uh, liver, small intestine, kidney, spleen. Old mice had t a virus in the nasal cavity over the first three days, same as young mice. Um, and also their, young, their lung function was disturbed as it is in young mice, but it's more prolonged. So 
Uh, and then the, these histological analyses, they score the lung damage. They had more severe uh, damage scores than uh, in young mice. Yeah, so all around the older mice get a lot sicker. Yep, than which the is a good, mice. it's an age-dependent illness, as in people said, it's yes, good, you can study this it. Is, this is shaping up to be a really solid model. This is a great model. These are both sexes that they're looking at the whole time? I would hope so. I Did would they hope say? so. Uh, it's, I'm sure I it's buried in the methods. If anyone don't cares, recall. it's to, probably in the methods somewhere. You have to, you know, NIH wants you to do that because in certain other infections, there's a huge difference yeah. between mm -hmm. male and female. Mice. Well, and in fact, in the human um, COVID-19, there's yeah, a huge skew. Right. They that's they right. should that's be right. doing both, and they don't note that there's any difference here. But um, okay. I didn't look at that. It's a good question. So, how about cytokine storm? Is there a cytokine storm in mice? So they looked at chemokines and cytokines in the serum and lungs of one-year-old mice at two and four days. They see at two days several cytokines elevated, but they say we don't know if these contribute to disease outcomes. And they can look at that in the future. So that's an interesting question. If we yeah. take some of the one of these away at a time, does it affect the disease outcome? All right. Now, it turns out that BALB-C are not the most commonly used mice. It is C57 black six, and it's the background of most genetically engineered mice. So what happens if we infect C57 black six mice? So why would you do that? Because when you knock out genes, and say you wanna knock out a cytokine gene and ask, is the disease different? That's usually done in a C57 black background. So they say, are these mice equally susceptible? Do they de demonstrate the same illness? And, and I think the reason they did this experiment is because they're about to look at a knockout mouse. So yeah. they first had to, in fact, like I'm not even sure what order they did this in. They may have looked at the knockouts and then somebody, you know, yeah, it's not working. we should also check the <laughs> wild type C57 black to see if there's a strain difference. So 10 week old Turns mice, out there is. C57 black, less severe disease and only the two yeah. highest doses, 10 to the four and five associated with weight loss, no mortality after infection. Um, so uh, they have a transient 10 to 15% weight loss, as I said, with that mortality. Congestion scores in the lungs never get high as high as with the uh, BALB C mice. Um, uh, clear peak in replications on two days, which is about an order of magnitude lower than in BALB C mice. Uh, and then they the virus titers decline. And viral loads in the nasal cavity were also relatively low. So, and their lung functions restore to baseline by five days. So they have an overall uh, milder infection and milder disease than BALB C. Now, it's a problem because all the knockouts are in C57 blocks. So yeah. what are you going to do? You and this, by the way, we probably can't extrapolate to humans because these are... Both of these are inbred laboratory strains of yeah, mice. That's right. That's right. Which have significant genetic differences between them. Um, mm -hmm. So BALB C and C57 black are more different than probably any two humans you could find. So it's not like there's going to be some population of people who are magically protected from SARS-CoV-2 because of their genetic. There, there might be some individuals who are better off with it. Um, but um, this type of systematic difference between strains is something you're only going to see in, in inbred animals. So there are, of course, collaborative cross mice, which are all... Uh, crossed um, eight eight different yeah. strains crossed and I'm sure they're looking at that to see now they approximate the diversity of humans genetic diversity yeah. of humans so that can be used to get at these and by the way we will talk next week about a cool paper that just came out showing people with severe COVID-19 have mutations in specific genes really cool stuff next time all right uh, do the tropism of these viruses differ uh, so in other words, um, does, does passing it change it? Uh, so they see um, slight differences in tropism. Um, it looks like um, we're not, we are not reproducing in uh, ciliated uh, epithelial cells. Um, some of the cells are the same and some of the cells are the same as in humans, but there are some slight differences Um so the, they say the tropism of MA10 is different in human airways, perhaps reflecting different cell levels for ACE2 expression between human versus mice, i.e. ciliated versus secretory club specifically. Uh, the nasal cavity of the mouse has 50% respiratory epithelium and 50% olfactory epithelium. 
And so they look up there in the olfactory region and uh, they think the virus is infecting not the olfactory sensory neurons, but sustentacular cells, which are support cells. And that would also destroy your sense of smell and taste as it does in people. All right, last set of experiments. Um, what's the role of the interferon system in protection? They infect C57 black mice lacking the type 1 and 2 interferon receptors. Those are IFNAR mice, and they're done on a C57 black background. The disease is more severe, in, even in black 6 mice lacking interferon receptor genes. Yeah. So clearly, interferon is important here. Um, and, and that it, lines up with human data that we've started getting that suggests yes. interferon is involved in more advanced cases. Exactly. That's what I had alluded to. We'll, we'll do that paper uh, next yeah. week. Uh, the last experiment they do is to show you can use this model to check um, vaccines. So they immunize uh, their, their, their Balbsy mice with uh, replicons made from Venezuelan equine encephalitis virus. Um, and they show that these protect, these induce uh, neutralizing antibodies and protect. And these are, these are um, VEE expressing SARS-CoV-2 spike. SARS-CoV-2 spike, yes, wild type spike. Um, and um, they, they show that this will protect mice against infection with MA10. So those changes in the spike don't interfere with that, which is uh, really good. Now, the interesting thing here is that the Vaccination with this experimental vaccine protects uh, the lungs, but it doesn't seem to stop immunis stop virus reproduction in the upper tract. Yeah, so it protects, um, when you say it protects against infection, it kind of protects against infection. It's not, not sterilizing. sterilizing immunity. So you still see virus replication in the upper tract. Right. And it's in the nasal epithelium. Um, and they see um, an age-dependent, response to the antibodies as well. So the older mice, the one-year-old aged mice, you don't get as robust a neutralizing antibody response, which yeah. is consistent yeah. with what we see in vaccines. In so people. in the lower tract, uh, only one old mouse had detectable lung titer. So most of them in the young mice are protected in the lower tract from even infection, right. I guess. Mm -hmm. But as you said, the upper tract is still infected. Even though they don't de develop disease, they don't develop weight loss or pathology, uh, they still have upper tract uh, infection, and they say so. Maybe it's going to be hard to protect the upper tract from infection with vaccines, right? So this ends up being a protective vaccine, but not a, a sterilizing immunity vaccine. And so, as we've discussed before, if you have a vaccine like that, it's going to be great okay. if you can vaccinate everybody and protect them from disease. Yeah. Um, but if anybody's relying on herd immunity with a vaccine like that, it's yeah, I mean, we're, so the anti-vaxxers should be listening, right? Now. The anti-vaxxers should go and get the vaccine. Everybody has to be vaccinated, because otherwise no. they they may get the virus. We have, we have expressed this concern before. The vaccine may yeah. not prevent infection; it may yeah, prevent that's, disease. That's exactly so, right. if you're vaccinated, don't think you can just go about. As you know, Tony Fauci just said, even with a good vaccine, we're still probably going to have to face mask. Did yeah. you guys hear that? This is yeah. probably why you can still transmit. And, so, wow. and it's not going to be, I mean, people have, have frequently discussed, oh, well, the first people we vaccinate besides the, the most vulnerable populations would be the, the medical community for the, the first, you know, the people who are, who are treating patients. But, um, you know, you do that, it just means they're going to be asymptomatically infected. Yeah. So they would still act as carriers. And, and yeah, you should immunize them because you should be protecting them from disease. Um, but they shouldn't treat that as, oh, well, I'm immunized, you know, now I can throw away my N95 mask. It would be fascinating if this mouse model actually turned out to predict if this the situation that, in humans. And I you know? assume that uh, that Ralph and his team are taking the uh, either the vaccines that are currently in trials or very close copies of them and popping them into this I hope so. model to see this what kind of results they get. This is the first good model. Everybody needs to be using yeah. this now. Um, by the way, remember, mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. Monkeys exaggerate. <laughs> I wanted to say- Yeah, so it's possible, even with all that gloom and doom we just gave, um, it may be that the very first vaccine out of the gate is wonderful and provides perfect sterilizing immunity. And gosh, I hope so. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, that'd be great. You should still get the vaccine because you get relying on herd immunity is yeah. kind of, um, kind of dicey. Um, but, uh, 
but this is another warning that that may not happen. So I wanted to summarize. You know, no, no, no. Go ahead. I wanted to summarize the tropism because I didn't um, do a good job. But maybe you're talking about vaccines, Rich. In which case, go ahead. Uh, I just I just want to say that you know this idea that a vaccine may only protect against disease and not infection. To me, that's not a gloom and doom scenario. Oh no. You know? Once you've distributed enough and you got uh, enough uh, uh, immunity in the population, okay, it's uh, basically going to take care of the disease. Simmer. Yes, but it's gloom and doom in the sense that if people misinterpret what's going on and think, oh, my neighbors got vaccinated, so yeah. let's yeah. party. Um, then yes, there's going to yes. be gloom and doom. Yes. Yeah, and, we're still going to, we're going to have mask wars going on for a while. Yes. Still. And everybody right. needs to get vaccinated because some surveys now suggest that half yeah. of certain populations don't want to be, but you, it's that's not going to work. Even if we have a perfect vaccine, that's not going to, that's not going to yeah. work out. Yeah. Everybody needs to get vaccinated so that I'm going to get vaccinated, but until everybody's vaccinated, I can't stop wearing my mask. Yeah, exactly. If I'm going to be a responsible person. Yeah. So you guys out there need to get vaccinated so I can get rid of my mask. So yeah. that's the key. If you get vaccinated, you may still have to wear a mask to prevent spreading it to others. Yeah. And yeah. maybe if people you're are, a responsible individual. And, you know, I already see people without masks here in New York and I don't know how that's going to work. I don't know what people are thinking. They are, maybe they're not. Yeah. They're not thinking. All right. So the tropism. Let me summarize it again. The tropism of MA10, this adapt passage virus in the mouse tract, generally generally reflects that reported in humans. Differences are the infected secretory cells in this model versus ciliated cells. So the ciliated cells are not infected in this model, whereas they are in humans. Okay. So that's a different. But they say everything else. This is ARDS and ALI. Really, it's, a, it's the first model. Yeah. All right, now, the mutations, what are they doing? Well, we don't know. But it's interesting that, all right, so many years ago, Matt Freeman was on Twitter. He, he was on a lot, actually, in the early years. Yeah. And he, when he was in Ralph's lab, did this experiment with SARS, SARS-1. He did the mouse passage and got mouse-adapted SARS, which was used to study SARS-1 pathogenesis. And they say that the changes are all different, different proteins between the two viruses. Quite interesting. So what about the ones here? So they have another spike change, which they think may be enhancing interactions with uh, the mouse ACE2. Uh, then they have uh, ORF6. They say this is interesting because ORF6 is an interferon antagonist. So you, this change must be improving it's interferon antagonism, right? Because now it's, the virus is more virulent uh, in mice. NSP7, oh, here's the cool part. This is very exciting in my view. NSP4, 7, and 8 are needed to create the membranous environment in the cell on which viral RNA is replicated. So they are needed to get efficient replication. And so I think the proteins have changed to better interact with mouse proteins that help to induce uh, that membranous environment. I now, agree with that. I have to say, many years ago, I had a graduate student, Julie Harris. Did you know Julie Harris, Alan? I think she was I after I remember you. Julie. Okay. I met her. Yeah. So, rhinoviruses do not reproduce in mouse cells, even if you put the rhino, the rhino, human rhinovirus receptor on the mouse cells as a transgene. But she passaged the rhinovirus in mouse cells and got a variant that would reproduce in mouse cells. And one of the key mutations is in a protein that's involved in generating the membranous web for RNA synthesis. So same idea. Okay. Unfortunately, we took that virus and put it in mice years later and it did not cause disease in mice, but we didn't pursue it. Okay. So. They, per, they passaged their virus in mice, which we didn't do. We passaged it in mouse cells. Am I making myself clear? I'm very, very excited yes. about this. This is a cool yeah. thing. One of the things that one perspective that sort of interests me on this is that this is almost like a spillover event from humans to mice. Okay? Yes. <laughs> and one of the things that, one of the things that uh, uh, we would like to know is, you know, when you're seeing a spillover in, event from bats to humans, for example, uh, what what's required? 
what sort of changes are required uh, to adapt to humans. And we don't know. I go back to this conversation I had with my wife early on that I've talked about before where she says, well, you know, the sequence, come on. <laughs> of this virus, and, you, you mean. know, that doesn't help because we yeah. don't really know what all these things do. And this is, this is interesting that, uh, n first of all, there's changes in one, two, three, four, five genes, including spike. Okay. Uh, we don't really, we have some idea what those genes do, but we don't know completely. And we don't know what these changes mean, though I agree with Vincent's analysis. It's probably adaptation to the different environment in the mouse cell to do what otherwise would be the same thing. And importantly, as you pointed out, Vincent, two different closely related SARS viruses, the original SARS and this one, uh, if you do the same spillover into mice, you get a mm -hmm. different uh, set of genes involved. Those two viruses had to come up with two completely different answers. Right. Yeah. Now, I don't know that it was the same mice that we were spilling them over into, you know, but nevertheless, yeah. it's really complicated. We don't have easy answers to this. Yeah. And to, to me, one of the important things is that that means that I th we're a long way away from being able to survey all the animal populations and pick out the viruses that are going to spill over into humans. Right. We're not going to be able to look at spillovers until they happen. Okay. And then deal with it at that. There point. are, but there are some, there, there are some clues we can look at and we yeah, can say, yeah, okay, yeah. these are more likely to spill yeah. over. Those are less likely, but it's going to be in broad brush strokes. I think right. if you have um, viruses that can, the first thing is, can they reproduce in a human cell line? Right. Yes. And if yes. they can, then that's worrisome. Not all yeah, the right. SARS like coronaviruses and, the way, and bats can do you that. Know, the way the way you get at these questions is to do this type of experiment and also to go out into the field, collect a bunch of viruses from from animals and start looking at mm -hmm. them and looking at where they go and looking at maybe other animal to animal spillover events and what kinds of we need to try and find Are you saying we need fundamental research? We need basic research, yes. And we probably also need to cooperate with uh, other nationalities yes. to do the appropriate collection and analysis. Yes. Yeah, we should. We should. Uh, yeah, actually, you just mentioned something I hadn't, I hadn't considered before, just because I'm dumb. <laughs> Which is this idea of taking all these isolates you get out in the population and doing host range studies on them? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah in sure. culture, in tissue culture, and in animals in a laboratory. Well, I remember uh, that's very interesting. It's often sequences, so you have to recover virus. But True. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. So here we have the first mouse, um, any model, any animal model for age dependent ALI and ARDS. Everybody needs to drop what you're doing. Take this and use it because it, there's no point in reinventing the wheel. Uh, I know people are trying all kinds of things. This is the answer. Classic virology. This is a classic virology paper. There's nothing fancy here. You're passing mice. You're doing pac plaque assays. You're doing histopathology. There's no goddamn omics that tell you very little. <laughs> there's just basic stuff. And it just justifies that that's what we have to be doing in virology. And all you other kids can get off my lawn. <laughs> Are you saying is, I'm a uh, Torino or whatever that was? No, no. <laughs> What's the name of that movie? Grand Torino? Gra Grand Torino. Grand Torino. Or, yeah. I just think that uh, people forget. Let me forget, finish my rant. I just pe yeah, think yeah, people yeah. forget fundamental virology is needed to do any of this stuff. You can sequence all the omics you want, but until you do an experiment like these, these are what, what are going to provide the answers, folks. Basic, basic virology. And this is just a beautiful paper. This is the way it should be done. It reinvigorates my faith uh, in, in uh, the virology community because it's just the way, the way to go. This is the way. I this don't know. is the way. Yes, we, we have seen the way. I really like and, this you paper. Know, this is, um, <laughs> on, honestly, it's the kind of thing you expect from Ralph. Absolutely. <laughs> so congratulations really, to Ralph really and everybody work. on the paper that did the work. Yeah. Really good stuff. Keep it up. Yep. Yeah. And great everyone job. else. Great job. And, folks. and he says at the end, this is this is what everyone should use. This is available. So you can yeah. probably get the virus from him or if you you can Call just see the sequence and make it yourself, but he'll give it to you, I'm sure. Yeah. I shouldn't speak for him, but no, I but love yeah, it. I'm pretty sure he will. <laughs> I like it very much. And I think we're gonna yeah. learn a lot. And I know people here are trying to do all this stuff. I said for I sent them this the other day. I said, just Forget it. Do this. This is the way to go. 
<laughs> Good stuff. Okay. Let's do Those some were email. Brevia, by the way, brief, short discussions of papers. That mm-hmm. yeah. actually, they're more like our old. Uh, they're like our old paper discussions. Sorry, and yes, they, and they were worth it. They're not. Yeah, they, I think this uh, was necessary. But um, you know, we've recently curtailed the length of our paper discussions to try and accommodate more email. But this, these are important. All right, let's see. And and as the as the pandemic has progressed, and a lot of the early desperate questions have been not answered, but at least we have provisional, you know, we, we've come around to a point of view on them. Um, I think it's appropriate that we're doing more discussion of the papers and the science behind this. And that's, that's our coverage has evolved. Yeah. Once again, for the newbies out there, this is kind of like what TWIV used to be. This is what we used to do. It's pre-pandemic. We would sit around and talk about a paper for an hour and, and fact, uh, so get used to it. We even have picks of the week today. We're going back to we picks. Have picks. I saw yeah. that. I was so excited. <laughs> <laughs> and I've started putting picks of the week on my blog. They're not necessarily science, but people had asked me for recommendations of some stuff. And I said, yeah. oh, fine, I'll just blog them. All so. right. Uh, ben writes, dear Twiv, a few episodes ago, one of you gave a short riff on the concept. I don't know if short riff is really a thing we'd ever do here, is it? <laughs> <laughs> on the concept of equilibrium between a virus and its host. The idea was that herd immunity was only one form an equilibrium might take, and there were other examples of how equilibria are achieved. I take it that not all these forms are benign, in fact, far from it, though many are. I began to think of what an eventual SARS-CoV-2 equilibrium would look like compared to other viruses like influenza. One hypothesis is that SARS-CoV-2's equilibrium results and it being another common cold coronavirus, dangerous to the frail, but otherwise largely benign. Oh, this is someone who listens to us. Yes. (laughs) Compare that to influenza's current equilibrium, killing 290,000 plus worldwide year after year after year. I don't think this insight, such as it is, has any import for current policies. One of my comparons is, after all, still a hypothesis, and continued masking and distancing can save many lives on our way to any eventual equilibrium. Perhaps it serves more to remind us how bad influenza really is, but a balanced consideration of which is worse, COVID or influenza, may have more to it in the fullness of time than immediately meets the eye. Uh, Ben is a retired U.S. Air Force in California. I I absolutely agree. This tells you how bad influenza (laughs) is. You know, the common cold coronas are pretty benign, but influenza is not always. And why is that? We don't know. But uh, yes, influenza does not achieve this equilibrium uh, that the, at least the common cold coronas don't. So it's beautiful thinking. Very nice. And, and a major, <clears throat> probably the biggest reason that influenza doesn't achieve this sort of relatively benign equilibrium is that it changes so yes, much that's from right. year to year. Whereas the coronaviruses don't. They're, you know, you get, you get, one of the common cold coronas yeah, yeah. and it's the same virus you That's had right. That's part of it, yeah. five years ago. And so, you know, you've got pre-existing immunity to it. And and even though we have flu vaccines, they don't apparently last very long. Right. And so that's a problem as well. And so keep that in mind for SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Yes. Uh, Rich, could you take the next one? Greg writes, Twivers, I am writing outside of Austin, Texas near Driftwood. Rich will surely surely know where I'm referencing. I'm going to stop right there and give you a rap about driftwood. (laughs) (laughs) Because this this got me going. I love this. So I live in South Austin. I probably live about mm, 20 minutes from where he's talking about. I live in very South Austin. And and if you, if you, if you drive, you know, five minutes from where I am, it drops precipitously off from Austin into Texas. Okay. <laughs> from Austin into Texas. That's good. <laughs> and uh, uh, Driftwood is, I would call in the sort of foothills of the Texas hill country, really nice countryside. Um, is it near Dripping Springs? <laughs> it is near Dripping Springs. <laughs> there you very go. Very good. Very good, Dixon. There you go. And we have occasion to drive around this area. We have a, uh, when there's not a pandemic around, a weekly drive to Wimberley, and actually we visited uh, some of the places that he uh, mentions here, uh, the Salt Lake Barbecue, which, uh, you know, barbecue in Texas 
is uh, as much a cult as it is as cuisine. I think Salt Lake, I'm going to get mail for this, but I think it's overrated. But there's another <laughs> winery nearby with a Trattoria Lucina that's a really a delightful place to eat out in the country. And as you're traveling through this, there's all these signs that say you're going to Driftwood. Okay. And then all of a sudden, the signs are pointing the other way. <laughs> like, where was Driftwood? Okay, and I actually, driftwood, this actually, just drifted, said leaving driftwood. <laughs> this drifted actually all. happened to me. I went through this intersection with an uh, 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 old defunct Texaco station on one side and a church on the other side. And all of a sudden, the, the signs were pointing the other way because I was looking for driftwood. I actually you stopped the car. It. I stopped the car and turned around and went and I said, is this driftwood? And it is. Driftwood has a population, according to Wikipedia, of 144 and is 1.3 square miles. That's pretty but gross. Every, but everybody knows, even Dixon knew, that it's near Dripping Springs. You bet. Dripping Springs. I've been to Dripping Springs. It's a beautiful place. Actually. It is. All these, uh, the countryside here is very nice. So, Dripping Springs. I just had to rant about Driftwood for a second. Oh. It is 76 Fahrenheit, and it's a beautiful day to be alive. I am just an ER doc that found you when MRAP, an ER education series, mentioned you in March. That's great. TWIV has become my favorite new entry on my busy podcast feed. I have become obsessed with this pandemic. It offers so much to learn and explore regarding a vast number of disciplines, virology, and more broadly, microbiology, epidemiology, medicine, economics, and sociology. It has cast light on our society's structural racism, igniting uncomfortable yet necessary conversations. It has revealed humanity's potential for good in the face of global adversity. If the pandemic wouldn't have uh, so much suffering, death, and activity restriction, I would feel fortunate to be living through it. <clears throat> but that's not why I write. <clears throat> it's clear you know these things. Instead, I want to share an experience and a passion as they relate to the pandemic. The first is a weird phenomenon I experienced over the last months. I knew something was happening. I just didn't consciously understand it until you pointed to this podcast by Thalia uh, Geigerns, uh, um, Gigerenzer. Gigerenzer. Thalia's podcast is a great podcast that uh, profiles the show. After listening, I realized I wasn't alone. I had developed a friendship with people I'd never met in person. You've mentioned this before, but your conversations really do make me feel like I'm sitting at the lunch table discussing virology and this pandemic with my friends. As a result, when I'm at that lunch table, I get an overwhelmingly sense that it's overwhelming sense that it's going to be okay. I like that. Your conversations take me back to one of my happiest times, college at Washington University in St. Louis. I almost went down the microbiology career track. I became enamored with molecular biology and spent a semester in Eric Richard's lab back in 95. Apropos of today's conversations, I was playing around with PCR. Regarding TWIV, I love the thoughtful conversations, the banter, the reviews of important papers, the interviews, really all of it. I even love the misspeaks and the medical slip-ups, which remind me that we are all human and that you are not uh, and that you all are not physicians, which I sometimes forget. By the way, Daniel Griffin is very good. His breadth of medical knowledge and ability to spring, explain complex tox, uh, co topics is excellent. None of that compelled me to write, but without this context, the real reason would be out of context. What really compelled me was Vincent's apology to Dixon. It really touched me. We're all aware that we are often harshest to the people we are closest to. Regardless, the apology was heartfelt, needed, had no excuses, and was direct. Dixon's acceptance was touching and on the point as well. The apology was needed. It is what friends do. And it reinforced why you all are important to me. Whew. The second reason I write is related to something that I think you and the TWIV nation might find valuable. I started writing about the pandemic to friends and family back in mid-March. I write as a scientifically minded ER doc attempting to explain all relevant pandemic and medical science to the non-medical and non-scientific crowd. It took the form of letters to humans. They were daily for about one and a half months and now they're weekly. 
uh, the receipt list grew to the point that Gmail would not let me send them from my personal email. Then recently I migrated to a website, www.letterstohumans.com. Uh, and he gives a link to the about page or that is the about page. The 70 plus letters are tagged and searchable. I reference TWIV a lot, linking to short highlights, insightful summaries, and important tidbits. Here are some of the letters I would like to point to you if you're interested. Uh, the letter Postscripts Rock is where I wrote about what TWIV has become for me. It's about halfway down. The now and famous 640 episode was covered in Game Changer. A couple of other ones where TWIV is prominently mentioned, to test or not to test, Good science takes what? Mutations don't matter. If I were to direct you to every letter with tw where TWIV is referenced, I would literally have to list over half of them. Please share letters to humans.com. While many won't listen to a two plus hour podcast, good scientifically minded and thoughtful information is important and unfortunately hard for many to find. Perhaps TWIV Nation can use letters to inform their friends and family. Importantly, these letters are a way uh, your impact is being amplified. Keep on twiving. You are what you are doing matters. Thank you. And now for my standard salutation: Stay emotionally connected and physically distant, Greg. <laughs> P.S. Regarding the glasses fogging in six six five, remember, um, Greg is a an ER doc. I'm glad Vincent mentioned the JAMA uh, Otho article that he and Daniel discussed in the medical update portion. The article noted the observation that glasses wearing folks have lower hospitalization rates than glasses less crowd. With all this focus on mask, we seem to be ignoring the eyeballs. As a person who wore a mask even pre-pandemic when it worked during procedures, I'd like to point out two things. Glasses are fogging because there's not a good seal around the nose piece. Notably, I was able to essentially eliminate fogging when wearing a non-medical mask with a simple plastic nose clip I found on Etsy. Secondly, please read What the Heck is Doffing, where I discuss advanced maneuver number 21. This, <laughs> this entails placing a little paper tape on the nasal bridge to create a good seal there is an accompanying picture. One piece of paper tape can last longer than you would guess. I guarantee both will eliminate or at least greatly reduce fogging. This should allow people to keep wearing their vision enhancing eye protection. Isn't that what Kathy Excellent. said last time to put a little piece yes. of uh, tape over yes. here? Yeah. Yep. Greg, cool. this is a nice. wonderful, wonderful Thank letter. You. This is a win winner, and we will uh, post your link to uh, Letters to Humans, and we really appreciate it. By this the way, it's and a really good site. I checked it out, and uh, he, he, he summarizes a lot of our episodes and other stuff, and really well done. Good job. And I think Greg and I probably ought to do lunch at Trattoria Lucina when all this lets up. Yeah. So stay in touch. Yeah, really good. All right. Dixon, can you take the next one? You bet. Unless you want to shush. <laughs> Lowell writes, while I did notice you shushing Dixon a couple of times, I would have been shushing him as well. You did well to apologize and he deserved it, but keep your chin up for you are a good guy. Second that motion. Uh, the, the practicing large animal veterinarian for 24 years and uh, is located at Merck. So maybe. Uh, cool. Yeah, very cool. All right. Shush. What is shushing? I think uh, it did. means you want me to shut up. I did more than shush. <laughs> uh, Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. David writes, Dear Twiv, I've been listening fairly religiously since about April. I now find myself very confused about some SARS-CoV-2 matters that I thought were settled a while ago. When discussing vaccines, you all noticed the difference between, noted the difference between vaccines that prevent infection and those that prevent disease. And you recently noticed that most of the vaccines in trials are to prevent disease, not infection. Then you voiced significant concern that vaccines that only prevent disease will still leave people at great risk because those who have the vaccine can still get infected and the virus can spread to others. But 
I thought it was fairly well settled that infected people didn't spread the virus until they had an elevated viral load, usually as a precursor to disease. In other words, although there is asymptomatic transmission, there was almost always, this was almost always pre-symptomatic. Just prior to the onset of signs or symptoms, as a person's viral load increased significantly and that person could start shedding the virus. I assumed that the corollary, contrapositive, I don't remember which, was that people who never progress to the point that they develop disease likely never have a viral load sufficient to be infectious. In fact, I thought this was the basis for the MINA testing regime. Okay, a uh, little time out here. Um, I'm agreeing with the head shaking this way. Uh, it, this, <laughs> so this is, this is not quite right. Um, Estimates on the number of truly asymptomatic people who never know they have the virus, but they had it, uh, are they range from study to study, but I've seen typically something in the 20%, 25% range, it's safe to assume. There are people walking around with the virus, shedding the virus infectiously, who never develop symptoms. And they are a significant, they're not the majority, they're not even probably half, but they're like a quarter um and that is happening we're we're sure that is happening now that's a real thing a minute um, test has nothing to do with that right it's not the right. basis so for the so the the viral load that you need to spread the virus is less than the viral load that you need to develop symptoms the mina thing is if you are shedding enough virus that it's detectable then the test goes off Right, so that he's got a le he's talking about a, a less sensitive test. It's not the PCR test that's going to tell you, oh, there's one molecule of RNA in your nasal passages up beyond your eyes um, from something that has long since cleared. The MINA test that or the tests, the family of tests that he's talking about, will say, nope, nothing there, nothing there. Hey, there's something there, and by the time they say there's something there, you're infectious. <clears throat> now, you might go on to develop symptoms or you might not, but that's the key is that you can definitely have a viral load that's infectious <laughs> without ever showing symptoms. <clears throat> um, okay, so continuing with the letter. So if people who never got a viral load high enough to get the disease, shed the virus, uh, isn't preventive. So if, so, okay, so yes, the, the question that you're then asking is based on this presumption that the vaccine that is protective against disease would necessarily be protective against spread. But as we just said, that's not the case. I, uh, I think one way of thinking about this is that it's almost as if the vaccine that we're talking about, the, if you like, imperfect non-sterilizing vaccine, increases the fraction of asymptomatic infections. Yes. Up to, you know, most of them. Maybe, maybe 100%. So, yeah. so right now, if 25% of the people who get this virus never show symptoms, which is a reasonable figure based on the data, but they are infectious, the, the vaccine, if it's a protective vaccine, but not a sterilizing, not a, not sterilizing immunity, um, then you would have 99, 100% of the people would get the virus and be shedding it and be infectious, but they're never going to, they're not going to develop symptoms or they're not going to develop serious symptoms. We don't really know what's going to happen. Yes. We don't These know. are yes. hypothetical. No, as, exactly. as we said earlier, right. yes. when we were talking in the show, we could, we could end up with a vaccine that provides perfect sterilizing immunity. You'll never be able to get infected with the virus and it lasts 50 years. As a matter um, of fact, it occurs to me that this, the idea that immunity wanes and people get reinfected is not even really well established at this no, point. I think right. so a lot of that's, we're oh, using the common cold curve coronas as a foundation. And exactly. That's, like, yes. Right. Exactly. We're, we're extending from the common cold coronas, which is a valid approach right. under the circumstances. And we do actually now have valid reports like well vetted, documented cases where somebody mm -hmm. got SARS-CoV-2, yeah. definitely had it, definitely got over it, definitely got reinfected with SARS-CoV-2 on a later occasion and was shedding virus. Yep. Right. We talked about that paper. Yeah. Yep. So you now have a mouse model that you can answer a lot of and these questions. And there's a mouse yes. model in which you can look at this. <laughs> That's right. The, the point is, you can definitely get this again. At least some people can. And we don't know, we don't know if that's a common occurrence yet because we just don't have the population data yeah. to look at that. And in fact, so far, the mouse model supports the idea that a vaccine may in fact not give sterilizing immunity. Yeah. Yeah. may just protect against disease yeah. and yeah. you still yep. get infected. Yep, yep, 
So we don't know, we do not know what the actual vaccine, a successful vaccine is going to be, but there is a pretty high probability that at least some of the vaccines that are being developed are not going to provide sterilizing immunity. Right. So we have to assume that that's the case. If we get one that provides sterilizing immunity, great, let's run with that and and we can, you know, rearrange based on that. But for now, we need to assume that it's going to be protective, not sterilizing, and that people could still act as carriers. Um, so continuing with David's letter, similar question about possibility of reinfection. You discussed some evidence at least two people had been reinfected. I think Dr. Barrick also said uh, that this was to be expected. There are always some people who will get a virus after beating it once. However, I think you also said these two infected people didn't get sick. Well, if there's a risk of reinfection, but it doesn't carry risk of disease or only a small risk, then can't we assume that people who recovered from COVID-19 or who have antibodies are at very small risk of reinfection? Two cases out of millions of infected people, an even smaller risk of getting infected and having a viral load sufficient to infect others. Again, we have two proven cases out of millions of people. We could actually have millions of cases. But you don't just, know it because they're asymptomatic. We just don't know because they're asymptomatic and they haven't been tested. So this could be this could be a ridiculously common occurrence that we've just only properly documented for a couple of patients, or it could be a rare occurrence that we happen to pick up for a couple of patients. Um, I'm kind of suspecting it's maybe kind of common because the chances of having picked up the two patients who just happened to get it, if it was a one in a million thing, yeah, that's <laughs> pretty unlikely. Good point. Um, so point. I think this is, this is probably going to turn out to be a common phenomenon. I don't know how common and the, the whole, you know, if you're protected from disease, you're not necessarily protected from being a carrier. Um, then maybe I'm looking at all at this all wrong. Yes, but we corrected above. <laughs> and apologies, I've got some terminology wrong. Um, anyway, thanks for all the great information. Now, if I can only explain to my friends on Facebook that just because they didn't get very sick from COVID-19, it doesn't mean they have a less dangerous strain of the virus. Good luck yes, with please that. Please do explain that to them, David. Good luck with I that. Wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say you got it all wrong. I would say you're asking all the right questions. You're asking all and, the right and questions. And thinking about That's, it correctly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And, and the only reason we can answer these questions is that we actually have the data yeah. Now, yeah. I mean, a couple of months ago, these would have been questions like, I don't know, I don't know. Um, but now we have these <laughs> these reinfections yeah, where we can say, okay, this is what's going on. And we can look at the common cold coronas and see this one is behaving a lot like that. Um, I mean, it would be great to know uh, what the viral load in asymptomatic people are oh, to yeah. see what the transmission of the virus is all about. But we can't do that experiment. Right. We do but you know can that do it in mice. We <laughs> well. do know that asymptomatic people can get a high enough load to transmit. That's right. I think uh, we don't know. We don't. We don't have detailed dynamics on all that. I mean, they could get really high levels and still not get sick yeah. because somehow yeah. they're protected against the yeah. pathogenesis. Sure. Right? And and we yeah. also know that the worst pathogenesis, as we were talking about earlier, is is not really viral. Right. So. You if know, you don't get sick, you won't get the cytochrome storm. And exactly. And so you may you might be able to develop a, a ridiculously high viral load and spread it to a bunch right. of people. That's and right. you, you don't feel sick at all and everything's fine because right. your immune system took it out and then didn't go nuts. But somebody else develops it and their immune system goes on to cause all sorts of havoc. I think what mm -hmm. we should do is someone should do a trial where they just take, I don't know, 10,000 people in various cities and just... Uh, swab them for a month daily, and that way you're going to pick up asymptomatic infections. You can look at yeah. the sure. kinetics, sure. right? Yeah, sure. That's something that needs to be done. And uh, but I, I'm not so aware. phase three trials. Are we going to look at their antibody titers? Oh yes. yeah, good point, oh, yeah. Vixen. Uh, uh, so, Vixen. Vixen. Yes, good point. It's okay. So thirty thousand people. You should pick up those twenty percent that are going to be asymptomatic carriers yes. in that trial. Yep. Sure. Yeah, yeah, but the, the antibodies are one shot thing, though. I'd like to have a daily, you know, PCR. Yeah, well, I agree with you. No, I totally yeah. agree with you. Yeah, you'd like you'd like a time series in, in one For individual, sure. seeing the infection, seeing it go away, seeing it no come question. back maybe. And then the natural history of the viral infection. Natural history that's of the virus. I think that's going to take it. a few years because right now, anybody who's signing up for clinical trials, they want to put them in a vaccine trial. True. But yes, those vaccine trials are looking at some data that will be tangentially answer, answering some of these questions. Yeah. 
All right, let me take one more and then we can move to picks. Sure. Uh, this is from uh -huh. Wayne. D Dr. Vinny, hope you're well. Just <laughs> read this, what's up with the CDC? Would you pr please bring this up on TWIV? We all need truthful, clear, and scientific answers on this. Many feel the CDC is unre unreliable on issues concerning our virus issues. And uh, he sends a Politico article uh, from... Uh, September 21st, CDC backtracks on warning that coronavirus is airborne. So you may see some time ago, the CDC posted an article saying that the uh, virus is airborne, which means it's in the tiniest droplets that can travel long distances. And this was worrisome. And now they say that was just a draft and we posted it in error and we're updating our recommendation. So I don't know if this is wrong. Why would you even have a draft? Set? <laughs> I guess it's like you have obituaries ready to go, even though people aren't dead yet. <laughs> I don't. Oh, they do. They do. <laughs> yeah, no, I know they do. They don't have mine. I can assure you of that. But uh, they have famous people. But it oh, is not. Uh, I mean, the point is that there is some airborne component, as we have all said at some time. But we don't know. It's not the majority of air transmission. Most of no. the air transmission is via the big droplets that fall to the ground within five, six feet or so. And the smaller ones are happening, but under special conditions. And so I guess CDC. Yeah. I, I think a lot of this is just a lot of uh, flap about how exactly do you describe this accurately? Okay. Yeah. And people blow it. Okay, and then they say, ah, oh, they're getting the wrong impression. We got to change how we describe this. Okay, and you know, people are all people are all on edge, and they're uh, they get upset prematurely. Just calm down. Okay, yeah. and, and I think in this case, it was it was an honest error by the CDC. I don't think this was one of these political things where they accidentally said the truth and then were forced to recant it because <laughs> yeah. that was not consistent with it. Right. With right. an ongoing campaign. Right. Um, I think in this case, they probably posted something that they they wanted to phrase a particular way and they phrased it badly and it got and then they realized, oh, no, we didn't mean airborne, airborne. We meant uh, no. I don't know how they can do that. I've never made a mistake. No, no, I, we don't make mistakes. I mean, the it. problem is, what do you mean I by do I mean, when you when you cough and sneeze and talk, you make droplets that are in the air, yeah. so they're airborne, and maybe people, they are airborne. Yes. So, but aerosols is what we used to say for the tiniest ones, and the droplets are the bigger ones. And so, yeah. saying it's airborne is okay. We've always known it's tr it's transmitted in the air, but if you mean airborne as the aerosols, then it's not right. So, right. This is just, and it's but, not a black and white thing. <clears throat> it's not like yeah, right. you're infectious yeah. out to six feet and then it yeah. <laughs> stops at <laughs> zero. Right. right. However, <laughs> as we have said before, CDC has made mishaps, and um, on multiple occasions, it's the people high up that are responsible. You know, yes. the, the scientists who we know, we're, we have faith in them; they do good stuff. Um, it's just that the front-facing part of the CDC often makes blunders like this. Mm -hmm. And, tend and, to, and particularly uh, um, the the political appointees of recent years who are right. who are now beholden to non scientific viewpoints and yeah. and and I know we have people at the CDC who listen to the show and I, I really y'all I feel for you it's <laughs> I mean this uh, aerosol is not the first time remember they said oh if you were in contact with a confirmed in fact, the person you don't have to be tested. Now they reverse that. That as well. was a political reversal. Yeah. So right. that was that was one where they they accidentally, um, <laughs> you know, they they were speaking the truth, and that that was a problem because they were saying people should get tested if they'd been in contact, and then they said, well, you know, maybe you don't have to get tested, and and of course you have to get tested if you think you were in contact with somebody who has this. Okay. Let's, Wait a minute, finish the letter, Vin. Fencing. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, I don't mean not to finish it. Yes, it's very nice. Um, now I have to scroll all the way up. Okay, by the way, your apology to Dixon was very honorable and in true samurai fashion. Stay strong and well. Wayne is in Wakayama, Japan. So give me a sword, Dixon. I'll... I'll Impale myself. <laughs> no, 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 no. Samurai no, no, fashion. That's not no, what he that, means. That is not what he no. means. I thought they, they do a harakiri. 
No, that's only when you're not apologetic. <laughs> you want to apologize to yourself at that point. <laughs> so the samurai. Oh, we're done. We're, 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 we're balanced. The samurai were honorable, right? They yes. were. Yes. But they were that. also absolutely cruel people in some cases. Yeah, well, it was a, it was a feudal society. It was it, the um, they reminded me of the Cossacks. Okay, but, but, but also but, Europe in the Middle Ages. But honorable in yes. the sense that well, they had a code they to did, live by. They did yeah. what they yeah they had a code. They did. Right. Yeah. Now I am, but it was very not rigid a, rigid code. I have to tell you, I'm not a cruel person. I, we know, do know this. Just so you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's take some picks. Me neither. Picks. <laughs> Yep. Wow. Picks of the week. Picks of the week. Amazing. By the way, folks, those of you who have just joined us, we uh, used to do these picks. We're going to now resume where each of us picks something that we want to pass on to you. You know, in the beginning, exactly. we're supposed to have a science bent, but then like everything else. Uh, <laughs> we digressed. We digressed. <laughs> Dixon, what do you have for us? Well, I've got a follow-up on uh, this uh, epidemic, this pandemic, I should say, because the pandemic, uh, at least for a while, created a, a lull in human activity outdoors. And it alerted wildlife to the fact that, uh, are they gone yet, so to speak? And, <laughs> you know, and they would come back out and peek around the trees to see if nobody was there. And nobody was there. <laughs> so they kept coming out further and further. And pretty soon you had moose walking across your front lawn, et cetera. So that is a hint of the fact that what it would look like if we did go away. And of course, we're not going to go away. But. People are, the populations of people throughout the world are not similar in the sense of density. And Europe is one of those good examples where the population density is actually going down. As a result, they can afford, at least that's the way they look at it, to give land back to nature and to let it, and the term they use is rewild. So this is this this is the uh, Rewild Europe website, and it will show you the progress just over the last forty years in restoring wildlife without having to lift a finger. All you have to do is leave it alone, and we don't know how to do that for most of the other things. Rich, I, I can see your face, and you know damn well that this is true. You can go anywhere on this planet and find evidence of humans. Even down yeah, to the oh, yeah. Mariana's Trench. You can go to the bottom of Mariana's Trench. They found a newspaper. <laughs> That's not was funny. Some, was somebody sitting there reading it? No, well. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that was a good uh, visual. I, I mean, uh, yeah, so. I've I'll been, cherish that. <laughs> so, um, as I've said before, uh, my home is now the schoolhouse for my grandchildren. Right. Uh, when they're in virtual school and uh, uh, after school activities, we try and, you know, uh, make some of it, you know, a little bit uh, intellectual. If you like, we've been watching nature shows. Yes. There's this new, um, yes. new nature show on um, PBS. That's a three part series about islands. Yes. Yes. Wonderful. And you know, wonderful. they just the, did Borneo. It was fabulous. They just did Borneo. We watched that yesterday. Yeah, it was and great. This is and not Rich's pick, by the way. No. <laughs> no, he's so uh, sort of <laughs> actually. He's actually backing on mine. <laughs> it's it's, re it's relevant, yeah. and uh, uh, you know, one of the messages right. in all of that is always how badly the or well, I was going to say how badly the humans screw things up, how much they change it. This okay, but I love and, their. Uh, you know, the Borneo that didn't happen until the end of that episode, and it started started talking about you know the clearing of the forests and stuff like that. And Porter, nine years old, goes, "Oh no, not again!" Yeah, <laughs> did you see what they what they did with found plastic along the beach, though? Yes, right. In the beginning like, of this, they said lures. they melted it down and made a blue crab, which they then used to lure up octopus off the reef. Yeah. I thought that was fabulous. And I also was stunned to realize how much of an effect bats have on the understory yeah. of the forest. Yep. They eat all the pollinators. Yep. And as a result, there are no plants that grow down on the bottom of forest next to uh, bat caves. So this so rewilding Europe is a, um, uh, what, what are they, a non nonprofit? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Cool. It's probably part of the EU if you look hard right. enough for it. But um, they're remake, making remarkable progress. They have wonderful maps that show areas that used to be habited, inhabited and now it's not. 
Yeah. And the animal life has just come right back. I mean, it's cool. just come right back. And so it didn't actually go away. I was right about that. And they have so a cat did. video on the front page of their website. So there, there you go. <laughs> so this is the big hope for learning how to leave our own lives without spoiling all the other lives on this cool. planet. So that's why I put it up. This is why Great. we like pics, folks. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Rich, uh, Alan, what do you have for us? I have a book that I read recently um, that I really, really got a lot out of. It's called How to Do Nothing. Um, and I could, I could have written this. It, no, this is this is a very deep philosophical dive into the the attention economy, uh, um, which is the whole industrial complex that that buys and sells your attention. Hmm. And so Jenny O'Dell, the author, um, starts off by explaining the importance of attention. You know, you go, you go and you scroll through Twitter or Facebook and, and the site is free, right? You're not paying anything, but you're paying attention. Right. And people say, well, that doesn't count. That's not really worth anything. That's not something. But if you think about it, <laughs> your attention is what you pay attention to is who you are. Right. You pay attention to your family or you pay attention to the people you're talking to. That's that defines you. And so when you're giving away your attention to doom scroll through Twitter, that's what is defining you at that moment. And she is tracking you. Well, there's that, too. And she she delves into the way that this has that this has rebuilt our minds just in the past few years and the impact of that and mm -hmm. presents an alternative to it, which is, it's just very refreshingly done. And it's not exactly a how-to manual. It's not going to tell you, you know, do this and then this and then this to break your Facebook addiction, but it tells you why you might want to do that. And, and it just really, it's the kind of book you can't read and set down and forget about. So, it's cool. So I will uh, get this. But you know, we are not doing TWIV to get attention. You know, so no, we're doing, we're doing it to TWIV because we like to sit around talking to each other. Yeah, I mean, and Dixon, we found some other people. By like the way, Dixon and I did the first one uh, twelve years ago. Yesterday, we we released it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, our goal was just to teach people about viruses. Yeah. yeah, that's it. So it just so happens that a lot of people are paying attention now. But I don't know, it yeah, doesn't matter. And I might add that at that moment I was. I agreed to be your student, and I still am. You did? Yeah, that's that's why you came to me. I you came said. to you because you like teaching. I, knew I do you. love teaching, and I also like learning, and I, I thought this was a wonderful opportunity for me to actually learn something. You were I the think. first person I thought because you were a wonderful teacher and communicator. That's and I very thought nice. You would so be well, a good person. Looks like it's worked out. It seems to have, <laughs> yes. You bad rich. What do you have for us? Uh, so this is a video that uh, Kathy gave me. Some time ago, so she gets she gets credit for this. I even offered for her to keep this for a pick herself. She says, "No, you can have it." Uh, <laughs> and uh, I did want to save it for some time. Dixon's around because it's about mosquitoes. Oh yeah, and it's a topic we've talked about before, which is genetically engineering mosquitoes uh, to impact a transmission of malaria, either right. by uh, um, uh, putting in genes that make them so that they can't reproduce or that the females die early or somehow uh, affecting the population. There's some resistance mutations uh, as well. Uh, and in particular, I like this video, uh, two reasons. First of all, it describes, and I'm not going to do it here, it describes a gene drive very clearly, yeah. Okay, uh, which is a really interesting concept. Uh, and so I recommend it for that reason. Uh, and the other is this theme I was talking about earlier. They have this great journalist uh, doing part of this named Dylan Matthews. And I want to quote a little bit of his. He was responding to uh, GMO uh, objections to the modified mosquitoes as being genetically modified organisms. And we have to leave everything all nice and fluffy and natural, right? And we can't tinker with uh, mother nature, right? And Dylan says, no one in this as as big of a son of a bitch as nature. It is completely <laughs> indifferent to suffering. The earth is a horror show that we're trying to manage as best we can. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> Which I think is a wonderful perspective. Uh, people don't, you know, my, one of my favorite clips, oh, I'll save that for another pick to show what a horror zoo, uh, show nature is. But one of the reasons I want you to be around Dixon is that, you know, my immediate reaction is if these things work, uh, one of the, you know, outcomes could be that you eliminate a species of mosquito. Yes. So what, what then? This is, this is a strategy. And in fact, it, it's derived from a much older strategy called the sterile insect technique. Um, that, oh, that's uh, right. I forgot you have a history in this. Yeah. Yeah. One of, uh, a guy who worked for my grandfather, mm -hmm. Ed Nippling, um, developed that. And, and it is a, it's an insect control technique that, can lead to complete eradication locally. And, and this works. It's why American cattle are not parasit parasitized by something called screw worm fly, because we wiped it out. Ed Nippling's idea worked. Um, and so this gene drive approach is a much more efficient way of accomplishing the same thing and could be used to completely eradicate a species of mosquito. So... Should Is that going to kill us all, Dixon? And Dixon, you're on mute. Dixon, you're on mute. You're on mute, Dixon. We can't hear a word you're saying. That's because I don't know the answer. Thank you. <laughs> oh, no, that's not true. Uh, I don't know the answer, but I'll tell you what happens in most cases when you extinct one species, another related species comes in to take its place. Yeah. And if it's a mosquito species that doesn't transmit malaria, then we'll be better off for it. Yes. Yeah. Because okay. those mosquitoes are being eaten by things. Yes. They're food for things. And it, the critical thing with the gene drive approach or the sterile insect technique is that it yeah. is species specific. Right. Right. And there exactly are right. dozens, if not That's hundreds right. of species right. of mosquitoes. So if we, if we eliminate Anopheles gambiae, um, then yeah, some other luck. mosquito is going to move in. You'll still have mosquitoes, but you won't you have will. malaria because they won't be able to support Yeah, you. one way to avoid that issue is to infect them with Wolbachia. And then they won't go away, but then they still won't be able to transmit it. Right. So that's that's a compromise with nature that might work. In the uh, after the war, after the war, uh, Argentina decided to convert the pampas to uh, land for growing maize. So right. it was full of uh, plants, and they destroyed them all with herbicide, and they planted their maize. And then a new shade-tolerant grass grew in the shade of the maize, <laughs> and that attracted a new species of mouse that hadn't been there before, which carried a virus that then caused a hemorrhagic fever in people that no one had seen before. <laughs> right. It's all a series of events. Yep. By the way, the Chinese philosopher uh, Lao Tse said, nature is not human hearted. <laughs> no. That's and right. Randy, Randy Newman said the same thing. <laughs> but, you know, I would say humans are often not human hearted. <laughs> not human hearted, <laughs> they yes. They don't care about us, true. but we don't often, we're not often kind. All right. My pick is uh, one of my podcasts which I just released yesterday with Nels LD Tuivo number 60. So that's our fifth anniversary 60. podcast. You know, it's funny. We do one a month. So that if it were Twiv, we'd be at 300 after five right. years. But <laughs> this one is a special because we had 12 guests and, uh, wow. you know, they're not all on at once, fortunately, but Nels invited people to record a short video about where they think evolution field is going in the next five years. And it's a lot of fun. Oh, that's remarkable. That's what and is. cool. One person uh, didn't send in a video, but sang in a, send in a song, <laughs> sang a song. So you should check <laughs> nice. it out. It's really fun. Uh, Twivo number 60. All right. That is Twiv 667 where you can find at uh, microbe.tv slash twiv, all the show notes and links. By the way, all these picks, I do maintain a page where I keep all the picks so you could search for stuff if you want to find a book to read or something. Mm -hmm. Although I'm probably behind on my keeping that page up. Like most other things, I used to keep a page of all our guests and I haven't updated that in many months. Anyway, microbe.tv slash twiv. Uh, questions and comments, twiv at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us over at microbe.tv slash contribute. There are a number of ways that you can do that. For example, if you like Alan's pick, that's a link to uh, Amazon. You could use our affiliate link and we get a little fraction of that purchase and it's at no cost to you. 
Okay. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Pommier is at triclinella.org and the rivingliver.com. The Riving Liver. I love that. <laughs> you did actually say that. <laughs> the Living River dot org. The, the, riv, the Riving River dot org. org. Thank That's you, right. Dixon. Yes. Which is a lovely site, right, Dixon? It's uh, your. Oh well, favorite. thanks to you. Thanks to you. You helped me put that together very, very beautifully. Yes, thank you. I mean, that's the kind of friendship we've shared, and that's the kind of friendship we will continue to share. Uh, yeah, that's why I yell at you, because you're my friend, you know. I only no, yell. Don't, don't, don't go there. Don't go there. <laughs> uh, Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org and the ri Riving Liver. I did it again. Hey, the Riving, again. <laughs> the Riving oh, Liver. That's living. a good, that's a good uh, URL, liver. Riving Liver. Anyway, thank you, Dixon. Uh, Rich You're Condit welcome. is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He's currently in uh, Dripping Something, Texas. Austin, Texas. <laughs> what is that called? Dripping what? Dripping, Dripping Spring. Springs. But Dripping we were talking about Driftwood. Driftwood. Dripping right. Springs is nearby. Yeah. Thank Dripping you. Springs is a real town. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Alan Dove is at alandove.com and on Twitter, Alan Dove makes it simple. Thank you, Alan. Yep. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Yellow. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Yellow. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>